was good food, wasn't it? Anyway, yes, it was a bite means it hurt me. Whatever you want, bro. Alright, let's get rolling. <laughs> get through this and let's see if, uh, yeah, move on. So, we're going to do uh, talk about some piping, water piping, pumps, and some stuff. For uh, some of the guys that have been around for a while, it might not be too much new, but hopefully it's, there's something there. But for guys that don't do a whole lot of uh, the hydronic stuff, it should be good. So, especially with Justin coming into downtown. Uh, Dan coming over and uh, just you know, and Noel especially. So um, yeah, so thanks for coming. As always, uh, shout out whatever you got, questions, comments, and that. And uh, you know, it's informal. And let's try to have have a decent time at it. So um, we're gonna go through some uh, types of piping systems, um, some water distribution, kind of how they how different systems are piped, uh, direct, reverse, and return systems. Uh, components, we'll get into some details, uh, some arrangements, and then we'll get into pumps. Most of this is centered around pumps at the end. A lot of the front part of this is kind of more information for you guys just so that when you're going out to buildings, you kind of understand how buildings are piped. It's not, of course, you're not expected to design a building, but it's good to know the different terms, uh, like just even up there, direct <coughs> and first return. Does anybody off the top of their head remember what that is from school or? been exposed to that in the past. So that's good. Dan, you look like you're thinking about it. No, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> uh, so we'll go through the three types of piping systems, uh, four types of distribution, differentiate between reverse and return, um, different uh, go through hydronic accessories, typical piping, um, mechanical seals, and then finish it up with some pumps. Um, I got quite a bit of stuff to kind of hand out. I was trying to make this a little more interactive, especially for guys that don't see a lot of the components or maybe have heard the terms but never got to really play with them and know what's inside. So that should uh, make it a little more interesting. Um, we're going to start off with the two types of loops, and this should be very familiar. Uh, closed loop on a closed loop, uh, just like the name sounds, the water isn't exposed to the air. Um, you're all familiar with cooling towers, open towers, and closed towers. Um, on a closed loop, it's just the loop's filled up. It's basically capped off, and the water is allowed to circulate. Um, in a closed loop, you have an expansion tank. Generally, you're always going to have a pump. You're going to have something that either does heating or cooling. Boiler loops are generally always closed loop. Uh, same with chilled water loops, where it's condenser water loops. Are, can be open or closed. Um, the big thing on these is the expansion tank. Open loops don't have it, and you'll see that in the next picture. Um, on this type of a setup, this is pretty common downtown with energy standards where you have a pump. This pump will be on a speed drive, and the way that those speed drives are, are operated, they'll put a pressure differential switch right in here between the supply and the return. And the reason for that is, as these valves open up, the pressure differential between this return and the supply decreases. So then the pump can ramp up because the pressure differential dropped. As these valves close off, this pressure differential goes up and the pump can ramp down. That makes sense, right? It's just kind of a, it's kind of a reset, but kind of a just demand-driven type system that's really common in any of the buildings in Seattle or Bellevue. Um, if you don't have a speed drive on this pump, you're going to have some kind of a bypass here so that when this coil closes off and this coil doesn't need whatever this is providing, chilled water or hot water, that can go around. Generally, this is on the last of the loop. So like Continental Place that Marcus is familiar with, the bottom of the loop, um, pretty much any of the buildings, if you don't have a speed drive, then you have this bypass at the end. Uh, the other one's the open loop. So the open loop, that's where you're actually taking water out of your chiller, <clears throat> dumping it into the top. There's a spray bar of some kind up here. That water is raining down. There's a sump, so there's water down in here, and that water comes back. So this basically acts as a big air filter. There's water evaporating. This traps all that crap down in the bottom. It's pumped back around, cooled, goes back to the chiller. Um, they take different types of chemical treatment. Um, some of you guys do your own treatment, know the difference, closed loop versus open loop. They do take different types of inhibitors and algae growth uh, type 
bacteria sites. Entering air or leaving water, is that the, pretty much the standard thing for chilled water coils? Are you talking for like an approach? Yeah. Entering air. If you're if you're questioning whether or not the coil is piped correctly, the air is entering. It should the leaving water should be the first thing it touches. If it's piped. Yeah, it'd be right. counter, <laughs> counter, <laughs> counter, counter flow. Yeah. Counter flow, yeah. That'd be an approach temperature. I thought that, that was a standard counter for it. That's what we're doing now. For what? That's, that's, that's counter standard. counter flow? Yeah. As far yeah. as I know, yeah. It's always been a standard. But if you're questioning whether a chilled water coil is piped incorrectly, if you look and you inside you see if it's entering air, the leaving water should be the first thing that air touches. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's your warm water. Or vice versa. Your, yeah. You don't want to be heating your air back up after you've already cooled it down. It counters the flow. Same, so with, picks up same all with water heat. coils on hydronic heat pumps. Is that the same? Yeah. No. Counter flow. And generally, any kind of a heat exchanger, whether it's a plate and frame or whatever, raise the plate. Yeah. yeah, they're all going to be like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as I think all of you know, the easiest way to tell an open tower from a closed tower, spray pump on the side. If there's a spray pump, then it's a closed loop, and the tower has its own sump here, spray pump, and the water in the tower does not touch the water in the loop. That's pretty basic stuff. If there's no spray pump, then it's an open loop. And open loop generally takes, uh, they're more efficient, but they tend to be dirtier loops, because any place that, you're, that you have one of these, it, may, it basically acts as an air cleaner in the city. There's just air comes in, it gets washed out through the water, and all that crap ends up down here. We'll get, get more fluid fluid. Yeah. So we're going to talk about different types of, of piping arrangements. Uh, this first one is a one pipe. This was real common in churches and places where you just had a heating loop. Uh, Lady of Fatima out in Magnolia, um, some of the older buildings up on Capitol Hill, First Hill, um, basically just came right out of a boiler. They had the they run all these here, but you have this, what's called a monoflow fitting. It's a little bit of restriction, and that forces this water up through this hot water coil, this radiator, and back. Uh, the advantages of these is that it's cheap. There's not a lot of pipe there. It's straight through. Uh, the downside is that this coil gets, gets cooler water than this one, but that's pretty common. Sometimes, lot, generally, you'll have some kind of a valve right here, either on the supply or the return. Um, that way, when it opens up, this monoflow fitting, which looks like this, which I've never seen a breakdown of these monoflows before. But as the water comes in, you put it, you can put it right here on the return side. It causes a little bit of restriction, so it forces this water to go through the radiator and back down. Um, they say if you put it on the supply side, it adds a little bit more, and then if you put them on both, it forces even more water through there. So if you're really trying to get some water to go through that coil. Get a lot of heat out of it. Does anybody have uh, older buildings with uh, boiler loops or just straight straight heat? Not so much. Well, Fatima. Continental. Continental. Has it. Has those? Yeah, yeah, it would in the school. This is exactly what what Continental has. In all the you see a lot of it too. Maybe not this exact setup, but like where they have radiant floor. You maybe have a small like little ray pad boiler. Yeah. Like the daycare over on MLK has radiant floor heat. That's all they have. They have a boiler up there, a couple actuators. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was, yeah, I never really heard this term before, monoflow. I kind of knew what they were doing, like out of, out of Fatima or Continental, but I didn't realize exactly what it was. It's just a, it's just a restriction to, to make the pressure drop here greater than this. And water's going to take the path of least resistance, and so that's where it goes. But if you were, if you did have a heater somewhere that Maybe it didn't get as hot as the rest. Well, that could be a reason. Either somebody didn't put this in right, or maybe it needs an extra one. Are those all rated with a CV or a GPL rating? They have a CV rating, yeah, for a pressure drop. So you know how much pressure drop they have at different flows. Yeah, they all have CV ratings. Uh, the next type of system that's pretty common is a two-pipe. In this, you'd only have you'd only have available heating or cooling at any one season. So these are generally like a like a seasonal switchover. So during the winter, you turn the boiler on, water goes through these, and here you can see it has its own return. So these, this, this heater here gets the same amount of hot water as this one. You don't want a tree? Water tree. It's a closed loop. <clears throat> you run the boiler part through the chiller? 
Yeah, it'd just be closed loop. Yeah, I don't know why not. The only thing is, my sheet glycol. You'd have to keep an eye on that. Go boil the loop and glycol. Yeah. Yeah. Especially on like makeup air units that, that are using a, a hot water coil to preheat incoming air, like for hallways. Yeah, you'd have to have glycol in there. Same, same as with a chill water. Loop. You'd have glycol. So, same thing. But yeah, that's the standard two pipe. In this scenario, the building engineer makes a call at some point to switch it over into, into summer mode. You generally wouldn't go like heating in the morning and cooling in the afternoon because you're talking a pretty good sized building, but you certainly could. I know the Electric Plaza had it, and they've since then switched it since Amazon. Yeah, Norton Building had it. Uh, There's a few of them downtown that had to just kind of make a judgment call based on complaints. This one I thought was interesting. This is a three pipe. I've never seen this. And it's, they stopped it for energy reasons, but you actually pumped heating water and cooling water out, and then they mixed on the return side when it came back. That's a temperance system? Right? Yeah, it'd be a, yeah, that's a good word for it. I've never heard that, but it's a three pipe. Yeah, use up floor, you cool it. yeah. yeah that's, I, I'm, energy codes have made this obsolete, but I thought it was interesting, so I left it in there. And this is their most common. This is still in use today, the four pipes. You have a dedicated hot water side and a dedicated chilled water side. Uh, these are in pretty much any any type of a hydronic building that, that have a boiler and a chiller. And those each have separate coils? Separate? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So like a, you'd have a just like a fan powered box with a hot water coil and a chilled water coil. Yeah. Those are real common. So here we get into different types of piping. Um, this is the, the easiest and the cheapest. This is what's called direct return. Direct return, your pressure drop adds up as you go. So if you look at this first unit, it has, it's the first one on the supply, so it has the most pressure. And it's the first one on the return, so it has the least amount of pressure on the return. So what happens is, is the most amount of water goes through this first one. The second most amount of water goes through the second, and away you go. So it adds up over time as you as you go down the line. So because of that, you have to have balancing valves. That's what these are. They're not a self-balancing system. So if you if you uh, just it's it's not like you're probably not going to identify this, but knowing what it is. So if you hear somebody talk about direct return, kind of know exactly what it is and what somebody's talking about. Like in a hotel type type environment, this would be a, a horizontal type loop where you have headers at the top. And then they come down as risers. Same thing though, you got your supply comes down as the first unit in, and then the first unit out. And then you can see the balancing valves there. So the next type is called reverse return. This is the most common that you see in Seattle or anywhere else. With some of these, you can get away from using balancing valves because the pressure drops equal as you go down the line. So here you can see unit one, it's the first one that's served by the supply but it's the last one on the return side. So it makes these lengths of pipe equal. That makes sense to everybody? Reverse return. The downside is it takes extra pipe. So instead of, instead of just having a length of pipe right here, you now have to run it all the way around, corner it, and run it back. But these are essentially called self-balancing systems because every unit has the same amount of flow through it. They all have the same pressure drop. Same type of a system in like a like a hotel or something vertical in a large building. Do you have Griswolds on those then? Automatic valve? Uh, they probably have an isolation valve of some kind and modulating. But you don't really need a balancing valve to start with unless you have different needs or different loads. So in a horizontal, it, this would be the piping arrangement here. Supply coming in, hitting all three, and then the first unit, the last unit here is the first one back. And then that's a that's kind of a funky one there where you have supply on the bottom and return on the top. I don't know of any buildings like that. We'll talk about some some types of uh, connections here. These are going to be very familiar, so we'll cruise through them pretty quick. Uh, welded. They do a lot of that down at the fab shop. A lot of the piping, a lot of the big piping that goes into the buildings. They just weld them all together. The yeah, others threaded. Threaded. You can only get so big. Of course, this is going to be steel pipe, and probably the most popular, Victaulic. There's a couple other names out there, but Victaulic by far is the most common. Um, you guys done a lot of work with Victaulic, I imagine. I mean, it's pretty much in all the buildings. 
just milk and all the same. Just go yeah. orange and clampy to the menu. There are different manufacturers. So. <laughs> like Matt said, pay attention. You can kind of see it on this one, but generally right up on the band, it'll say what series it is, whether it's 70, 71, 72, something like that. So if you're ordering gaskets for them, make sure you're ordering the appropriate gasket. Don't forget that loop. Victolic loop is very important. Yeah. Keeps things going. I just had the fitter come and do it. Or you can have a fitter come and do it. That's a pretty easy way to go about it. I figured that's his job anyway. Uh, some various fittings, elbows, saddle tees, caps, concentric reducer, tees and flanges. One thing to keep in mind on these flanges, there's full face, full face and then there's just the little raised face. Raised face flange, you'll have a gap between this flange and the next one. Uh, full face, the gasket actually takes up all the way around there and those ones get pinched all the way together. Uh, guys break those flanges from time to time because there's a gap they think they need to be tightened. So know what, know what your face type of a flange is when you start tightening those things. There was a guy at the Brightwater project when they did that broke a, it was a, I think it was a 28 inch uh, valve, butterfly valve because of that. This thing didn't start tweaking out again. Uh, speaking of butterfly valves, uh, we're going to get into some valves here. This is probably the most common valve that you see for, for on off duty. These are also rated for throttling. You can see the notches, this should be very familiar. There's a lock that's generally on the top of these. You set it, set it for balancing reasons. There's a screw you drive down on the top, locks it into place. These are generally pretty cheap and durable. Versus like a gate valve. Gate valves are not used for throttling. You'll see these on bigger boilers and chilled water loops. An easy way to tell a gate valve is it has this extra body up at the top. That's where this big, uh, this big gate slides up into and out of the way. These are not to be used for throttling. So if you ever come across one that, that somebody has, has set for some reason, these aren't supposed to be used for throttling. There's, there's better choices for them. But on these, sometimes you'll see these leak. This is a packing gland up here. It's kind of a Teflon rope. Has anybody ever done these packing glands before? You can take these bolts out once it's once there's no pressure in the loop. And there's like a, it comes on a spool. Matt, have you ever done any? Where they, yeah, where they have the, the yeah, Teflon rope. Or whatever. What's that? <clears throat> that like putty rope, sticky putty rope. Yeah, kind of jam it down in there and then uh, put that, yeah. that, that packing net back on the top. Yeah, we don't do them a whole lot, but it comes up. Uh, globe valves, globe valves, you, the difference between these two is this whole gate lifts up and out of the way. They're not good for throttling because they don't have any type of a linear flow. So if you open it 10%, you might be getting 85% of the flow through it. They're just not good for that. And when you crack it open, the water is forced to go through this little void right here. Read it out too. Yeah, it gets wire drawn, exactly. Versus like a globe valve or any of the, most of the throttling type valves, they actually plug from the top. So there's more force coming down. It's kind of almost like a piston. So like in a globe valve, these are rated for throttling duty. The water comes in here and hits the face of this plug. The downside of these globe valves is kind of how you lock them into place. They're not, they don't really have a good way to do that, but they are rated it as a balancing duty. Uh, this is an angle valve. So this would take the place of an elbow. It's also balancing duty. Same type thing as a plug valve. It's got a, got a seat, a plug that just lifts up. It's the full face, so they don't get wire drawn as well. They're, uh, they're more rated for it. So with both of those, this one and the one before, like especially on water heater at home or something like it, open them up all the way and flush them and wait until you get before you show them. A lot of people just will open it, get a little dirt out, and dirt still coming out, and crush the dirt in there, and it stops to hit the seat, and then it just leaks forever. Actually, another good point, too, is when you're – when you're opening these up, open them all the way up and then close them back down about a turn and then leave them. That way, if for some reason this plug gets hung up and it won't go down, you can go back a little bit. Whereas if you just open it fully and then for some reason it seizes, say it's 10 years and nobody touches it, you can't go forward. Well, now you can't go back either. So try to leave just a turn. That's one of the steam fitter tricks. That way you got a little bit of wiggle room. Uh, white type valve, balancing duty. It's got a kind of a Y shape to it. Same type of a deal. It's got a plug and a seat. 
And then plug valve balancing. These ones are, uh, they just get have this little opening. And this too take the place of an elbow. And these ones have a stem on the top versus uh, like a hand wheel. So they're more made like for your boiler loops where you can set it with a wrench and then leave it. Somebody doesn't tamper with it. Are those wire ones, are those good for like shut up or just balancing? Oh. Okay. Oh. They're, they're made as a balancing valve, but any of them can be used as a full shut-off valve. Remember they have up all, all valves like upstream of them and downstream of them too? For like a, like a blowdown? Yeah, so like, like you know, isolate them and take them out or do whatever you want. Yeah. Well, speaking of the last one, ball valve. Uh, ball valves are, are made for open, closed service, just like Justin said, for fast open, fast closed. They're not made for throttling. Uh, unfortunately, you see that a lot of hydronic heat pumps above ceilings. You see a little well, sharpie mark. If you call uh, like uh, AirTech, they'll tell you that those valves they sell with the hose kits for the they made for it? pumps. Yeah, or if you actually read the handle, it'll tell you 5 GPM max or whatever, 10. And you can, you can, they'll tell you to shut it till you get your 10 degree split and lock it. It's actually got a lock on that, it. Yeah, that's the difference that it has a lock. It's so actually maybe they're forward. slightly different then. If you, yeah, if someone give me a picture of those, mm -hmm. I'll put them in this because that'd be good to, good to have. Because I wonder too, like a standard ball valve. I threw some of our TI guys under the bus for in the that. company, not to the customer. I'm like, they didn't put balancing valves on none of this. I'd be curious. <laughs> was it? They were like, yeah, they're actually they're on all. <laughs> I'd be curious if it's the same type of a setup as this, being it's a full balancing grade. Well, I'm sure it's full form, but I wonder if this ball is different in yeah. their type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if it's got like a cut, because like this one's just a straight crescent shape yeah. because of the circle, you know. But I wonder if it's more of like a, it's got like a, <clears throat> like a cat's eye or something that's more for balance. Well, it's just an elf. It's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what about triple duty valves? Do we? Oh, you're in luck, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> you are in luck. Everybody with a free <laughs> We're gonna get to that, but we got swing checks. Everybody should know what a swing check is. That's not good. I know that Doug has some special information on swing checks that he's told me. I don't know. I mean, it might be true. It might not be. A, uh, Peter told me he came out to a job and he saw these two and a half inch valves installed beautifully. Bunch of them. Check valves. He's like, he made his apprentice take them all out and turn them at a 30, he said 32 degree. And the reason is, is they, without any pressure on them, they, are, they, they wouldn't swing they close. Won't check. I don't know about that. I, I, what he's saying is that, so these valves, and I'll pass it around so you can look at it, but uh, these valves, they, they swing closed just by gravity or back pressure. Doug's saying that a fitter told him once or told somebody that they're supposed to be cocked to the side at 30. She said 32 to 32 degrees. degrees. Very specific. So that it closes properly. Did I don't you know. say she? There yeah. are fitters. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just a fitter. Really? There's girl fitters. Yeah. Yeah, all over all there. If you're using swing checks, these are position sensitive. They got they can't face upwards or down because the, the swing wouldn't close. Um, one thing about any check valve, if you put it in a horizontal line pointing up, it's you gotta make sure whatever it's going through there is super clean. Because what'll happen is is you put this in a pipe, the pump pumps it up and it stops. And then the water sits there, and any debris comes down and settles on the flapper. And then when it goes to open, if there's too much debris on there, it may not open. So keep that in mind. It's always recommended to put, put check valves in a horizontal line so that debris can't sit on there. But that's just kind of a guideline. But the swing checks, they're, they're especially vulnerable to position. These ones, you can take the top off of so you can service them. Um, I've seen these on the Daikin system. Um, where they'll stick, and because they don't have that, just all those BRF units have really tiny, small pumps in them. And if you put a check valve, if this flapper sticks at all, they can't pump against it. So it's nice that you can take the tops off of these and actually get in there and, and kind of loosen this thing out. Please put check valves on the discharge button. 
It goes up to the Kinesi gate and then it can dance. Well, that's that for anti migration. Well, like on a, on a condensate pump, any like your Beckett's or little giants, they have a little check valve built into the discharge. But all that is is a little plastic ball. Uh, and they get stuck in there, or they rattle around until they're not—they're too small to plug anymore. So generally, if you have an overhead drainage, so you're pumping into your overhead and then gravity down, it's real common to put a check valve in that line, just so that the water weight is taken off of that little poppet, that little that little ball in there, and that's carrying the weight. That brings us to the next one. Everybody heard of a spring check versus a, a swing check? Spring check, just like this, it, uh, it's not position sensitive because it has a spring in there. Holds it closed until water pushes on it. It does take more pressure to open, so keep that in mind if you're putting on like a little tiny condensate pump. Um, it takes more than like that little swing check does, but it does give positive shutoff. Whereas that, if you put it in there just at a slight wrong angle, if you don't have enough back pressure, it won't close off. Whereas these things, the positive. What's the pressure generally on something like that? Yeah, that one probably says, that? does that say on it? Generally, it's 150 or 300. Is one of those things that we do. That's the only thing that we're going to do. Does it say on the outside? Yeah, uh, if you put it on 45. And a, a spring check like this is always going to have an arrow on it so that you can identify what direction it's supposed to go. So it's going to put it in backwards. I don't see if it happens. <laughs> Wait till you see one expansion chain. Never put these on expansion chain. I think this is 200. If you only if you see one on expansion chain, they need to come out. Yeah, we're we're going to talk about expansion yeah. tanks too. The expansion tanks just yeah. let water go in and out. Yeah. Uh, the other one's a lift check. I've never seen these that often that I know of, so I didn't go get one. But it's the same principle. Water comes in the bottom, lifts that check up, and then it comes out. It's just gravity, just like the swing. You guys seen swing checks or the lift checks very often? The biggest thing is identifying a check valve as opposed to a strainer is what I've been trying to teach. The check valve looks like a strainer. If you've seen a brass body with that thing. And lucky for you, I got All right, I'll try I got one. Mm -hmm. So we'll go through that. Um, control valves, you've probably seen these a lot, three-way and two-way valves. There is a difference between diverting and mixing. And if you go to MI controls and you get the wrong one, you're going to be kind of sorry that you did. Uh, they all have arrows on them. On a three-way diverting, there's two outlets and one inlet because you're diverting. So you have water coming down the line, and instead of going straight, now you're going to divert it down, or if it was going down, you're going to divert it this way. So a diverting has two outlets and one inlet. So make sure that when you're going to pick something up like that, or if you're looking at one that's already in place on a coil, that you are that you know what you're looking at. They do have arrows. Generally, if this is a Honeywell, it'll have an arrow down here, and then one goes across, and the other one kind of peels down like that, and be like A, A, B, B, something that arrangement. And then the mixing, just like it sounds, there's two inlets and one outlet. So if it, you, this would be like if you're trying to get a like a a water temperature on a hot water coil. You're trying to mix, trying to mix two to get one particular temperature. That'd be your mixing valve. And then your last is your two-way modulating. These can be throttling due to your positive on/off. Generally, they're modulating you know, with a with a uh, throttling range to them so that they can vary the flow. This is more the ideal piece for balancing. If everybody's seen these circuit setters, they know what they are. A circuit setter is a they're made for, for balancing. They have they're designed inside. I'm gonna I'll get one for at some point. But they have a they're they're like needles, I would describe. They're, they're they're kind of a weird restriction inside, but they're made to not have wire drawing across them. But they have this uh, they have this adjustment wheel with this gauge on the side. And then the balancers come in, they plug into the Pete's plugs, they have a device that reads the pressure drop, and then based on what they set them at, there's a flow, a particular flow that goes through them. What do you mean wire drawn? If, uh, if you take a, uh, you take like that ball valve, 
and you closed it off almost all the way, and you just left it, uh, water is eventually going to eat its way through one of those surfaces, either the brass or that stainless ball, probably the brass. That's called wire drying. Yeah. And it's a generic term for, for steam or for water or whatever your, whatever your fluid is. It's just kind of called wire drying. But when you look at it, like if you get one that, that say you get a ball valve that doesn't hold anymore, and you look at it, it looked like somebody took a hacksaw and, and actually like filed it down because it's so clean. Like there, there's been instances where guys will see it and they think somebody manufactured it like that because it's such a clean uh, cut. But it's called wire drying. I should get a picture for that. That'd be a good, that'd be a good one. That also has uh, you see those a lot on uh, on pumps on uh, pumps that are on drives so they, they on the discharge yeah pumps and to maintain well just those bigger ones yeah. just like Doug yeah. said tri triple duty valve this is this would go on a pump discharge and this has three functions like that at a, at a continental place mm -hmm. on those at a, a lot of your bigger buildings uh, that have constant volume pumps this is doing three functions it's a shut off so you can isolate and work on the pump. It's your check valve, so that when you turn the pump off, this guy slams closed, and then it's also a balancing valve, yeah. so it does all three. So like on these, you can see there's a there's Pete's plug here and there's Pete's plug here. That's so a guy can can plug into it with a meter and measure how much flow is going across it. And then the stem here is calibrated. It's got a gauge on it, and then so you can set it exactly where you want it to be. So on the circuit centers. If you have a frequency drive <clears throat> operating, you know, pressure differential, whatever you're scaling, you don't use a manual circuit centers. No, you, you would use, use pressure pressure independent valves. Yeah. Ones that are, uh, what Doug was asking was, what if you have a speed drive? If you set a, you set a circuit setter to flow five gallons a minute at, the, at pumps running at 60 hertz, but all of a sudden you slow those pumps down, What's going to happen to that heat pump that needs five gallons? I mean, that's pretty low, but uh, five gallons a ton, we'll say, per minute. Um, you'd have to have a pressure independent valve, a valve that would adjust. It'll let that five gallons, five GPM go through. Do you call them automatic circuit centers or not? I mean, yes. I have, have you ever seen one of those though? Like I'm thinking yeah. on like all the hydronic heat pumps in say 11, 11 third. Right where they have drives on those giant pumps in the basement. They're real common. Those flow, those those flow setters, flow control valves. Yep. You yeah. get them from AirTech. Yeah, because I mean they they run up the uh, Y signal and then they have like a two through a minute. They have a range. Yeah, but those don't. Well, no, but those not, don't stroke. Not those stroke. Open. These just go in line when they work. Yeah, these just go in line and they they have a spring and a valve. And they will open and close based on pressure. Yeah, for a certain yeah. flow. Right. Exactly. Okay, gotcha. I'll get a picture I'm not of thinking of. I was thinking of like, like you were saying, yeah. like a just a water control valve that you know, a, a little Belima or something that opens and closes. Now, the minimal valve. No, these ones are mechanical. They, they have but them. I, 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 you don't see a lot of them though. It seems like they have a minimum like range, and so when yeah, they, they have, have a minimum, minimum pressure when you have no requirement yeah. for cooling or heating. They close so you get more capacity at the next valve. Right. Yeah. Build pressure to the next valve. And you well, and that it goes back to the beginning where <clears throat> it, if you're measuring supply and return pressure differential in your at building, your condenser water pump. Right. But if you come out to a building and you see a drive and you see a bunch of manually, you're gonna have problems. Yeah. yeah so you want to start all those coils or yeah, or that thing. If that happens at Russell Building. When uh, at night they'll slow the pumps down. Well, on, there's a there's a couple data centers in that building, and they need full flow, and they were having that problem in the beginning because they were trying to slow the pumps down, but the levers still need all that chilled water. So it happens. I mean, engineers screw stuff up all the time. Booster pumps. What? <laughs> yeah. What? Not ours. <laughs> all right. We'll talk about some uh, some com some components here. Uh, the first is the Y strainer. That came up once. One interesting thing about Y strainers that comes up over and over through the years. There's two different types of strainers. Well, first of all, yeah, these strainers, these are rated in mesh. 
And it's how many holes per square inch? Well, you have a construction one, then you have a right. main construction one. ones generally have bigger holes to catch the big stuff, or no finer ones finer to catch the small holes. stuff. Well, startup soft. Yeah, yeah. yeah. startup soft. That's a good one. Yeah. One thing about these, and I've seen this for years, especially like 9993rd or some of those buildings with dirty loops. They'll have a they'll have a nipple here and a ball valve, and the guy thinks that they're cleaning them by opening that up and blowing them blowing it down, closing it. So if you look at the design of this thing, the water comes in, it gets forced through the strainer and out. So this does fill up with crud, although it doesn't happen all that much. But when you open up this valve, what happens? You blow a little bit of crap out, but you're not cleaning the screen at all. So the only way to clean these things, if you're not going to open them up, which you should be opening them up, is to close off the, the inlet valve here and let the water come back through and down. And that way you're back flushing that, that strainer. Yeah, and if you have a, a pretty good size one, and you can't get that cap off with a wrench, you know, you can use a hammer and a chisel and it works effective. Uh, okay, so. <laughs> yeah. Say that again? Yeah, no, the, the cap on those, sometimes you can't get, the, you know, you can put a pipe wrench on there and it, it ain't going to work. You yeah. can take a hammer and a chisel and, and motivate that. Now the brass? Oh yeah. Okay. I was about to say, just go for a big, 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 big wrench. <laughs> you just, you just get you started. I know, I'm not, I'm not saying it wrong. Just, just hang it just in it. your chisel yeah. right on that cap. And you don't go crazy with it, you just yeah. get it going. And it's effective. It's way better than trying to get a pipe wrench this big in a quarter. I would say a shine. Try to get a socket <laughs> first. Yeah, that's Try to get a socket. Try to get a socket. Try to get a socket. Those are really soft. And I know what you're saying. That one was a bitch too. Just getting that one off, and that's yeah, small. That's a little that one. inch. Yeah. Don't we'll over tighten the O-rings. And this is that, that's <laughs> kind of funny. Know. That one is. That, <clears> that <throat> was after everybody over tightens those yeah. fucking things. Matt brings up a good point. These generally just have a little O-ring on them. You, you don't have to lube up the <laughs> threads with pipe dope. Nope. Why? Why would you do that? Like, you haven't seen that. No, compression shit. fittings, people lube, or it's okay to lube with compression fittings. Stop putting all the tape and stuff on them. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I understand. I'm just saying, like, because, like, whatever. I guess people. Orange corny, whatever. Just as bad as they put a lock glue on. I, I brought this I just in case that. this came up. Somebody said that. But like on a union. Don't. Everybody <laughs> knows what a union is. Yep. How many times have you seen somebody put a bunch of pipe dope on the streets? Because it won't seal. I put, I put a, a tiny. A little bit on the face, and I put a little bit of it to stop the message. You can put a little, a little bit on the face. press because it's blue, it's not. It's, it's a thread lubricant. I can it's see tighter. that, but yeah. we've all seen it where somebody blue playing with it. Shit. You got JV Weld around it. The fitters do use a JV Weld type product for that. <laughs> But now the, the, that uh, that previous con uh, contractor kept adjusting the uh, head pressure valve instead of cleaning the strainers on those hydraulic units. Oh yeah, that's about right. Yeah. Kyle, can I see that check valve? Which one? Yeah, the one. So, so when I told the building engineer I wanted to pull it out and clean the clean, clean the strainer, he says they're strainers. <laughs> they're not even best. The really, I pulled it out and, and then I dumped it out in the bucket. And he's like, well, "Holy shit!" shit. So then I did the the, the rest of the three all. Shit, yeah. Sudden, no more issues. Like yeah. that. No. Oh yeah. You're gonna, there's buildings downtown you'll get to know real well that, uh, that have strainer issues. And that it's amazing how many times we'll get a guy that goes out and that's the, that, that's what they think the fix is is to either they think there's air in it or they need to turn up the condenser well, water pump for some reason. And it's it's a close strain. Well, I mean because they, they because it goes the the, 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 the dry cooler up on the roof. Which and they come down, down three stories, so they have a, a greater way pressure way differential. Where you but when you different see the pressure from to control like 40 right. pounds, you're like, oh, yeah, something is good. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, we're going to talk about the pizza plug and stuff here in a few minutes. There's no, not, there is something there. There's no, there's no mechanical. Those are, those are balanced. Yeah. Usually they have a bunch of little battle little things on them, not a bunch of bouncing. Well, then they, then you have strainers in those too. They'll come out pretty far on the strainer, but usually it's the the spring and the balancing seat that that is actually moving in that look what looks like a strainer. That's why I was saying it's hard to tell unless you see a bunch. On the auto flows? Yeah. 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 They have that. Uh, 
that it's a stainless looking deal with the that pushes in with the spring on it, controls the flow. Yeah, a lot of times, yeah, the will have a strainer on the back side of it. Keeps the gunk out of there. I'll get a I'll get a picture. Go back it's pretty easy to yeah. This is your standard fill valve for a closed loop. <coughs> this guy here, uh, everybody should be fairly familiar with these. Bell and Gossett makes some Armstrong. Uh, this is there. This takes incoming water pressure. There's a strainer right here. Does everybody know there's a strainer before a fill valve? There's a nut down at the bottom. Take that out. Clean it once in a while. If you got boiler loops or chilled water loops, we'll clean that strainer sometimes. Uh, you'll set this based on whatever you want your loop pressure to be at the static pressure, the fill. And they're, they work pretty simple if you look at them. Water comes in. There's a little stopper right here. There's a diaphragm and a spring. When the water pressure here is less than the spring pressure, it allows this, this little poppet to drop down and allows water to go in. As this water floods in, eventually this pressure overcomes the spring pressure and it shuts it off. That's all there is to them. They're very simple. Pressure rate. Yeah. Um, what it, it's nice if you have a shutoff down here so that you can turn that off and set this outlet before we are either wait for the loop to fill up, but not always. And generally going around one of these, you'll have a fast fill. I got some pictures, but <laughs> these things tend to be pretty slow. Uh, speaking of filling loops, does you guys know how to fill up a fill up a loop in a building, how to set pressures? How many feet is how many The general guidelines, yeah, half pound per foot. Yeah. The true guideline is 2.31 PSI per, per uh, Per foot, or no? Building height divided by 2.31 equals psi to get to the top. Plus five psi. One foot ahead is 2.31. Is that right? Yeah, that sounds right. Um, so what's the plus five? So if you have a building, say you have a building that's that's 110 feet tall. Let's see if you guys can see red. I don't know. <laughs> You have a building that's 110 feet tall, and there's a water loop that goes up and back down. Say that this is your fill valve here. This is dumping water in here. You need to get up 110 feet. So we'll say 100, 110 feet. City pressure? Gee, right of being a pump. <laughs> if you take that 110 feet and divide it by 2.31, it gives you 47.6 psi. 47.6 PSI will get you right to the top of this building. That's that's how water weight works. That's just how it works. You're not concerned with how wide a building is yeah. with water. You're only concerned with how tall it is. So it it takes 47.6 PSI to get to the top of this loop. But once you're at the top of the loop, once you're right there, you don't have any pressure. You just gotta keep coming back. Well, no, you would need pressure to bleed. Down. Yeah. No, you need pressure to bleed. bleed. Yeah, so that's the plus five psi. That's the so general rule of thumb. Whatever feet, so you have pump <clears> pressure all the way up to the top. That that way, if you come up here with a Pete's plug or a pressure gauge and you measure it, you should have a minimum of five psi. That's what that what that means. Now, if you have pumps on the roof, say this is your boiler room up here, and you have pumps. Well, pumps have what's called a minimum net positive suction head. In PSH, we'll talk about that more in a little bit. But at that point, you have to set your pressure based on your NPSH. But if you don't have pumps on the top, this is your this is your guideline. You take your building height divided by 2.31, and when, that's your PSI. Would it make sense to put like a pizza plug on, like T on a pizza plug on top of your uh, and air, air, air bleeds? And then I mean, that, I mean, you pretty much get that nuts on. That would to. make a lot of sense. Yeah. What's a pizza plug? I'm going to show you in just a minute. About two slides of what a beats plug is. Um, but that's what this is. That, that's how you figure out. So speaking of that, so we know without anything else, the bottom of this loop is going to be, what, 52.6 PSI. So because of that, that's, how, that's why engineers sometimes put boilers at the top of a building versus the bottom. Same with pumps. Boilers are rated in PSI. The higher the rating is, the thicker the material has to be. So if you have a building 
and you put a boiler down at the bottom, it's got to have a higher pressure rating than a boiler that sits at the top. Down here, your boiler probably needs to be rated at 75 PSI to handle that, that 52, because they go in increments of generally 25 to 50 PSI. Up here, you could have a 30 PSI boiler, so that's cheaper. Same with pumps. All your pumps can be rated for less, less pressure. Now, this is a short building, but when you get up into 40 stories or 50 stories, that's generally why you have all the mechanical rooms on the top versus the bottom of the bigger buildings. Or the middle. I've seen in the middle. Or in the middle. Yeah, it's all water weight driven. Yeah. So you're not, same with heat exchangers, all that, that was, stuff. That was always a, 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 like a myth. They'd always turn the 13th floor of the building into the mechanical room. Because of that. the 13th floor we can right. do, do you have buildings that have net positive suction problems? Uh, issues? I mean, don't you correct those in the field? Or? Yeah, and we'll talk about that too, cavitation. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it happens. It's a thing. I, I've been looking for, I've thought, well, I've been... You, you, want, you want one? No, no, I, I'm always looking. <laughs> I'm, always looking for one. I'm always looking at the tower and the pump situation and saying, all right, is that pump, where's that pump elevation? Compared to yeah. the tower and, my pump, and I'm like, I haven't found one yet, so... Yeah, so does that make sense to everybody how, how water weight's calculated? Oh, yeah. So the general rule is half pound per foot. That'll get you close. If you took if you took that 110 and divided it in half, so you'd be at what, 55? I came up with 46 or 47. So that's pretty close. On the smaller buildings, you can use that half pound a foot. So the GPM is but, rated in feet, too. But if you're, well, and we're going to talk more about feet, but... If you're talking a 40-story building, you want to use more calculations than, than the general rule. But if you're only going a couple floors, half pound a foot, I mean, that's fine. But that's the whole point, is calculate how to get up to the top so that, and then make sure you have enough pressure so that at the top you can bleed some air. Because you can't bleed air without pressure. And air goes to the top, so that's the plus five. That makes sense, Matt? <laughs> well, I was trying to think what, what's in there. Uh, is there pumps at the bottom, but the equipment's at the top? Well, no, you're just, you just say up here, this is your top floor, so you're going to need heat up there. Mm -hmm. No, I was just trying to think, um, the half pound per foot works really good, so people don't get too discouraged with shit. What was I supposed to divide by? Yeah. Um, you know, if you have a four-story building, half pound per foot, every floor is ten floors. You're gonna, it's obviously we're just shooting, you know, it's a roll of fun. from the hip. But ultimately, at the top, I you want sixty have pounds of pressure, let's say, for my hose, so I can actually clean something. But I don't want sixty pounds in my loop, and that's where it comes in with the fill. So I have my sixty pounds up there waiting, but it's filling through a regulator, getting my loop to fifteen pounds. So the half pound per foot can work if you're dialing in a booster pump going up top. But if you're filling, like you said, you'd be filling from the top. You would hope so. so right. Yeah, generally you fill from the top, but not always. So it tends to be an exaggerated amount, but on a 100-foot building, 10 stories, all your stuff could be at the bottom. So it's more understanding the water weight and how to calculate that out. So if you get asked how much water pressure should you have, coming into a pump at the top of a building or how much pressure should you have and a lot of it say you take a call in a building they say well there's <clears throat> there's heat up to the fifth floor but the set but from six up there's nothing well that's probably an indication right there that you don't have enough water in the loop. but if you don't go into it with that mindset you might you might end up doing other checks for half a day trying to figure that out but you go down to the boiler you see that you have Say you have 20 PSI at the boiler, you know that the building, so a half pound per foot, you know that the building's 100 feet tall, and you should have minimum 50 down there, and you only have 20. Well, you don't have enough water to get to the top. No wonder it's stopping at the six floor. That's kind of what that goes towards. It's not so much that you're not designing a loop, you're not setting fill volumes or ratios, but it gives you a random amount of water. Yeah, so you can do it in your head. You're like, well, wait a minute, I know that. And that's a good that's a good scenario for the half pound per foot because you can do it in your head. But just so you know, so you don't get an argument with a building engineer, half pound per foot isn't the it's not the mathematical calculation. 
the mathematical is is the building height divided by 2.31. That, that's a big old printout out uh, sheet sheets that have all those bank formulas, pump formulas, and all those. We're going to talk about pump groups. Yeah. Expansion tanks. Everybody knows what an expansion tank is. Expansion tanks absorb liquid when they get hot. If you take a liquid, a cold liquid, water, whatever that is, tea, and you warm it up, it has an expansion to it. It's going to take up more volume. It does it too if you freeze it. Water is weird that way. Outside. Go out in 30, you're like, I should have Water shrinks, your air shrinks. shrinks. Yep. It condenses, right. it gets dense, and it expands when it when it gets warm. Water does the same thing. Water expands when it gets warm, it has to go somewhere. In a closed loop, it would go out the expansion bed or the pop off, you would hope, or blow a pipe. Well, instead, they put expansion tanks on them. We're going to talk about those for a little bit. But there's, there's generally three different types. There's an open tank. This is an older style where there's no lid on the top. There used to be some of these in, in uh, Queen Anne on Liebert's where they just have, it's just water filled up, fills about half this tank. There's no lid on it. As the loop warms up, the thing fills up more. And it's just, it's on the roof, so it has that water weight pushing down. That's what's setting the pressure in the loop. But you had evaporation. You, this was, somebody had to monitor this. If it didn't rain, they could evaporate and go dry. You don't have any water here. The next iteration was these were capped. These were these are a, a vessel, and there's an airspace at the top. These are generally horizontal on a boiler loop, and they have a have, they have a stem called an aerotrol that goes up, so you can set them about halfway, set the water about halfway, and have a uh, air cushion in there. As the water expands, it comes into this, it pushes up against this airspace, and that's what sets your pressure. It pushes up against that air. And then the newest one that you see the most downtown or any of the buildings or like your house is a bladder tank. There's a there's an air cushion in it. The water goes into the bladder and then the air surrounds the bladder. And that's what they look like. These are replaceable. This is a charging valve here. You take that off. There's a little bicycle Schrader valve in there. That fills up the void on the inside of the tank, not the bladder. The water goes in the bladder. This is your system connection here. That's what fills the bladder. These are replaceable. Has anybody done a bladder before? They're a bitch to fight that. Those bladders are thick. What will happen is, is from years of this thing, of water going in and out of them, they wear on the side of the tank, and eventually they get a pinhole in them. Then when you check air pressure, you get water. You get water coming out. <laughs> yeah, that's, and that's about the best. If, you're, if all you're going to do is walk up to it and put a gauge on it, the pressure isn't going to tell you anything, but if you get water, that's going to tell you a lot because now you've got water inside this tank. And the shitty part is, is once you get water inside this where there's supposed to be air, you get rust. So now you put a new bladder in it, now you got a bunch of rust and rough surface on the inside. That bladder is probably not going to last all that long. Yeah. And it's a replaceable thing, will permit the inspector only because it's a, it's a pressure it's vessel. Pressure vessel. Yeah, it is a pressure vessel. So check the, numbers every time look at it. the way you charge these things and the way you should be doing it, whether whether it's your house or, or whatever it is, is there's actually a step to it. And I put them in here for you. This was coming right off the Amtral website. These are their steps. Water pressure. So figure out where that tank is going and what the pressure is going to be where that tank connects. So expansion tanks go on the suction side of the pump as close to the pump and the fill as possible. That's normally where they go. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But that is your that is your suction pressure. That is the, the lowest pressure in your system is where your tank goes. So figure out what that pressure is going to be. If it's at the bottom of this building, it's going to be it's going to be 52 psi. If it's at the top, it's probably going to be 10 psi. So you pre-charge that tank to whatever it's going to be, whether it's 10, 20, 30. That way, when you open up that valve, the water doesn't come blasted in there and fill up the bladder until the air pressure builds. Because those tanks are sized for the volume of expansion. You don't want to fill up those tanks when the water's cold. That doesn't make any sense. When the water's cold, that tank should have hardly any water in it. You want that water to go in when it heats up. That's the design of it. So you charge the tank to the pressure of the connection of the expansion before connecting it to the system. 
once the air charge is complete. So should you do like five psi over <coughs> what, what your incoming pressure is? No, because then, then your system pressure is going to have to raise five psi before it starts going in there. So you want to get as close as you can to the system pressure. <laughs> you want to you want to be as close as you can, because when you open that up, a little bit of water is going to come in there. It's just going to go in, but you don't want it to start filling up that bladder. Because you keep as much room as possible. Yeah, if an if an engineer has designed that that tank to absorb 200 gallons of water, because some systems are big enough, they'll expand 200 gallons. So that's why the tanks are so big. You take water from 60 to 180 or 190, that's a lot. Of, that's a lot of heat. They expand. It expands a lot. And if you don't have a charge right, you end up filling that tank. You, you run out of room, and all of a sudden your loop pressure rises when it gets hot. It's not doing the job right. And then, your pressure, and then, then your pressure up. release start to shake, and yeah, you wonder if the boilers are going to blow up, or you should run, or call for help. And the fire department oh, shows up. <laughs> if your static system pressure is greater than 55, consult the guide. Uh, the reason is is that you don't these those bladders because you're pre-charging them, they don't want you filling those bladders up beyond 55 psi without some back pressure of water to kind of contain them. So what they have you do is they have you put a little bit of water in the bladder and then you pre-charge them above 55 or whatever you're going to do, and then you then you open up the valve all the way. So there's kind of an extra procedure for going over 55. It's not a balloon. They don't want you just putting 100 psi in the bladder without any, anything to, to contain it. So it's just an extra step is all it is. Pushing that bladder out into a pipe. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's possible. And so when these things, when when the water is cold, they should be they should be empty for the most part. There's always going to be a little in there, but they should be pretty well empty because they need to they need the volume to accept that expansion. If you have one that ruptures, uh, like Justin said, you'll get water out the out of the, the Schrader. Um, that's a, that tank's bad. Water. The only true way to check a tank yeah. is With the isolator. Right? You got to isolate it, and then you got to take the pressure off this line, and then you got to check your pressure, and it should match this. Should match your suction suction pressure of your fill. But if you're if you're at the bottom of a building and you have 150 psi down at the bottom, say your tank was at the bottom for some reason, you'd want to be careful. You wouldn't want a tank that's charged to 100 psi of air. You wouldn't want to close that off and then take the water out because that bladder could push out of the pipe and do something you don't expect it to. Most valves for draining their value get out. Yes, they are. That's why it's not even in this picture. Buddy. So you shut off that the valve. You shut drain, off this valve. Yeah, you drain that pipe, that or section of pipe. Open up this air vent, yeah, and then and, and then, then put your gauge on there. And it should match the system pressure. Yeah, because what will happen is if this was undercharged from the beginning, mm -hmm. when you shut this off and bleed it off, this will go to whatever it started out at. 12 psi is generally holding charge these things ship with. So if you if if this loop's going to run at 50, this comes with 12. As soon as you open this up. That water floods in there until that bladder is expanded enough that it's got 50 psi air in it. Because it, it, the air can't go away, so it just compresses. And eventually the air compresses to 50 to match the rest of the system. You come up to it with your, your little bicycle tire checker, and you're like, oh, 50 psi. Well, of course it's 50 psi. It's being pushed against the wall. That's why you have to turn these things off, bleed out the water, and then check it. We do a shutdown. It's just better than we always check it. Yeah. Because if you don't, then what happens is, is you get weird system pressures. Things things rise more than they should. When it's hot out, they cool off. They drop when it cools off. Um, you get a water hammer, check valve rattle. Yeah, you can get some weird stuff. Have you guys ever heard the point of no pressure change? Matt probably remembers this from tech school. You probably remember this. The point of no pressure change. That's what an expansion tank is doing. Is it's creating a point of no pressure change. You set that bladder, and it'll allow water to come in to absorb the pressure, or it'll allow water to go out and put pressure back in. I never even heard about. I've heard about the point of no pressure change, but I didn't realize this. This is straight off the Bell and Gossett website. If you were to put, this is the this is the wrong way to do it. But if you were to put a an expansion tank 
on the discharge side of the pump, when it kicks on, the discharge doesn't go up. The suction goes down because that tank <laughs> absorbs the pressure. It's the point of no suction, of pressure change. That's why you always put it on the suction side so that this can, that suction pressure stays the same, but the discharge goes up. We just don't have water flow. You have water flow. No pressure. You have the pressure differential. They used to, this used to be really common to do it back to do it backwards because of the less pressure. The problem is you have you have an issue with bleeding air out because your suction pressure drops. You you get in the position of letting air in possibly. It makes bleeding harder. That's where you put the air separator. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like a purge unit on a low pressure chiller. But yeah, so that that's a real thing. You. Somebody puts that tank on the wrong side, they put it on the discharge side of your pump, your suction pressure goes down. When you start a pump, your suction pressure should stay the same as static. It shouldn't drop unless there's a restriction. It stays what static is. That's your point of no pressure change. Your discharge is what goes up. That's what drives the differential. That makes sense? Is that a cool new term to spread around? <laughs> point of no pressure change? I had to explain what a waterbed was. <laughs> you know what a waterbed was? I had to explain how there's point of no pressure when you don't have water. <laughs> no, yeah, you didn't get a lot of rebound with them, but you get the waves. <laughs> it's not for white dudes. <laughs> uh, speaking of air separator, you guys have probably all seen these. Um, air water comes in. It gets forced, it starts spinning in here, hits this steel screen, the air comes out of solution, and then the water without any more air in it goes out. The air goes up towards the top. There's generally an air bleed or some kind of a valve at the top. Um, these normally have a, some kind of a sediment uh, valve on the bottom so you can blow the crap out because that thing, it's just a cyclone filter is basically all it is. So stuff's gonna come out, whether it's rust or pet air, whatever else. You ever have one work on the sediment part of it? I've never seen shit come out. I don't. I think it just know. stirs it up and sends it. <laughs> <laughs> it. That's what but I think. Well, me and old man Bob blew the one out of gates for the first time, and we opened it and nothing came out. Right? It just well, little, yeah, but a little dribble. <laughs> oh my god, it was scary. <laughs> <laughs> we had like a big like garbage bit, uh, can on wheels, you know, underneath it. Like, yeah. Like the ones that roll around gates. And he barely got that fucking screwdriver up there, a big long screwdriver. Bow and blew out. I mean, before I could even shut it. Oh, yeah. But it was it, that one actually had a lot. Maybe because it probably hadn't been done construction. since construction. Yeah. But that one got a lot of stuff. So you saw an air separator. So this is an air vent. This should be something that, that I think everybody's probably seen. I brought you a couple so you can play with them. This is the little Taco looking one. <laughs> These would be used on like a little hot water coil or something small. These settings, if you play with it, you can blow through it, whatever. But these, uh, when you screw this all the way down, it does stop it. So these are supposed to be closed for initial filling so you don't get a bunch of air and crack shooting up. And then in normal operation, you leave them cracked. Or if it's over something you're concerned about, keep it closed until you need to bleed it. And then you can open it. Oh, they just have a float in there. Does it ever fail? Uh, they yeah, do weird. fail, but these are pretty damn reliable. These are probably the most common, these Hoffman air vents. These are used all over the place. Yeah. They're not cheap, but they last forever, it seems like. And it's nice because you can vent that somewhere. Yeah, yeah, the drain or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Going to our in and out will be a stop. That, that or some form of it. Yeah, it's just an automatic air vent. When they, uh, in normal operation, like this, if you were to blow through here, same with this one, the air comes right off the top. When there's water in there, there's a float. It floats on the water and it shuts this off. That's when the crops and the air comes up. So yep. Yeah. 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 It is a good idea to pipe these to something because they do tend to sputter a little bit. So if it's over a drop ceiling, it's good to hook up a little copper line with an eight, eight inch bag and run that somewhere. Or a crack unit that has one or two things. Yeah. <laughs> These ones don't come apart. Yeah. The top. Yeah. Generally, there'll be a ball valve, you know. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, no, it's yeah. not always, but so you can valve it off. Yeah, you can spin it off and replace it really easily. Confirm that there's 
Yeah. In our area. These ones come apart. I was going to pop it apart. Somebody can manual that thing apart. You got to have your time on your until I usually polish those up. Oh, <laughs> 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 That's why we have a present. You already got your. You already got your. Oh, I wonder why now. <laughs> Go it's for it. It's called Never Dull. Sounds like that one Yeah, Never Dull. Remember, he told them to come for All right, somebody mentioned Pete's plugs. <laughs> what is a Pete's plug? <laughs> Justin, you might want to see this real quick. Pete's plug is a plug. That's this guy right here, the shiny looking ones. Pete's plugs go into pipe, kind of like that. It's got a little cap on it, like that. And then you get these. This is a Pete's plug fitting on a pressure gauge. Those guys will lick them, jam it in there, and then you can screw it on. I use lube. I'll pass it around, you can play with it. One thing that you guys can do and you should do is if you have these in pipes and you need to take a temperature of that pipe, oh, that doesn't work very good. this pretty works good. just fine. Uh, you, you didn't even like it. You didn't like it. That's what she said. I like it. You can take a diameter reading on both of those and see if it's jamming. But that is a great way to get temperature inside the pipe. All right, cool. What if it's wrapped in insulation? You're waiting. You don't want to mess the insulation up. That's a good point. Right. Do you have a rebuttal? Yeah, why are you checking pipe out in the middle of nowhere? Boiler. Found them all nowhere. Where are you? Some random pipe. You wait. You get somewhere. You gotta take a pressure. Guarding hose. You wait. You wait. I mean, that's the. After numerous times, I mean, what three or four times, would you wear out that rubber gasket that's in there? I did it for years down there. I've never seen one. Never seen one. It's the same size. It's the same size as the fitting made for it. I've never thought of it. I've always gone to the actual one that has the green. You're going to now. So you tell me why number seven. You're going to now. Oh, I'll just cut the insulation. Make it look nice. It helps if you like it. I feel like I'm for a second. Yeah. yeah. When they first came out, they're like, they didn't, do, bucks. They didn't do burn, did they? <laughs> they were how much? Really? You don't know what flesh Google is. Probably in grade school, they could buy All right, so that's a Pete's plug. You feel confident? You know what that is now, Dan? I do. Um, Don't stick my thermometer in there. Check it. No, just yeah, you're on some random pipe in the middle of nowhere. And then you can do it. Get get your get your push probe. Peel back the insulation and get your get your temperature. That actually looks bigger than the thermometer probe. It does actually. Where's the thermometer? Up? It's because it's dark. <laughs> <laughs> so it always makes it look a little bigger than the rest. <laughs> what? <laughs> You'll notice on these, there's two types of these Pete's plug fittings. There's a tall one and there's a short one. These tall ones are for if you have a smaller diameter pipe, like a like a three quarter inch, and you're not gonna 
You're, oh, you're, otherwise, you bury the stem of that thing in the other side of the pipe. So that's why you have these taller ones. How far do you, if you need this, how, how far do you jam it in there? Just pressure, the pressure. Just the tip. Just the tip. Just for a second, just see what it says. Just, yeah. just to see what it feels like. <laughs> how long? For how long? As long as you need. That's all my job. Jab stick you put on there. Just for a second. As long as you laugh. I think these other two are self-explanatory. Yeah, pressure gauges, temperature right. gauges. Uh, these are bottom mount. And those are back mount. Yeah, make sure you know that when you're ordering gauges, because you can go through random instruments to get good gauges. You got when the, you'll think, I just need a gauge. Give me a quarter inch gauge, but they'll be like, well, what is it? Back mount, bottom mount. You want. Liquid Four fill, non liquid fill. Yeah, you should try to get it. Two inches, six inch face, what is it? Yeah. And since we're on gauges, if you have a 100 pound system, get the 200 pound gauge. Yeah. Don't get the 100 pound yeah. gauge. Like, yeah. like a lot of stuff, try to stay in the middle of some of the range. Yeah. So, yeah, just that's a good one, Matt. Yeah. Um, it's try, funny when you run into the, your gauge goes up to 150 and it's got like 12 psi on it. Yeah, but dude, buy like a 30. You can't see them. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. All right, we're gonna go through some piping detail. Anybody need a break or we're good? Comedy break. Yeah. <laughs> um, so using all those, uh, all that stuff that we just learned about with Pete's plugs and gauges and and uh, shut off valves. Um, this probably isn't new to to anybody, but these are some, some typical uh, placement of components within a loop. Um, this presentation, some of it, some of the slides are from carriers, so they like to get the product out there. So that's why it's got that chiller in there. Um, there's your thermometer, your nice isolation valve, and your uh, strainer. So this is probably like on an open loop of a condenser loop. So you have a strainer in there. Um, of course, you got pressure gauges, which is a uh, value engineered out a lot of times, but on chillers, you never know. Um, these shutoff valves are probably going to be a butterfly type valve, like we saw. They tend to be inexpensive, fast acting, and uh, easy to work with, reliable. Air cooled, similar. You're going to have some shutoffs and temperature gauges um, so that you can service some things. And on a coil, this is where your modulating valve might come in, so you have some, you have your shutoff. So you can turn off or isolate this coil. If you don't have a speed drive or some kind of a way to modulate flow through this, if it's a constant volume system, so you have a, a, the pump that's serving this is running full speed all the time, you generally have some kind of a diverting or three-way valve in this so that you can divert water around the coil. Or if you don't need, say the water temperature is 180 and you don't need 180 degree air coming out of this thing, you can modulate this valve and divert some of the water away so it comes in and goes out. The other way sometimes they'll do it is you can drive it to go back that way. You can't go back that way, so I guess it's always that way. From supply to return, work some water around it so you don't have such a hot coil. And then that's generally your placement of your Pete's plugs. So like in this, all these coil manufacturers, they have specs for pressure differential, so a good balancer can come out plug their gauges into these, read that pressure differential, and tell you the flow through it. So that comes up every year during winter and during summer uh, for cooling, where you have a coil that's not performing like it should. You're not getting as much heat rise out of it as you think this should, or temperature drop. And generally, that's a function of not giving enough, getting enough flow through it. So you take your, take your water temperature reading, whether you put your probe on it or put your, put your thermometer in the heat plug, you get 50 degrees here, and up here, say you're getting 65, 70. That's probably an indication of, of poor flow through there. A balancer can come out. They can plug in between these two, pull the specs on this coil, and tell you how much flow is going through it. Ideally, you'd have a balancing valve down here, or probably on the return side, that would have, have Pete's plugs on it and have a CV rating like Doug mentioned. A CV rating is an engineer speed for a pressure drop. So they can use a, a chart and they can compare the pressure drop compared to what the valve stamped at CV rating and tell you how much flow is going through it. I don't know how you calculate the CV rating. I didn't look into that and I forgot how to do it. Although we got the Blimo valve class coming up. Yeah, here and that's months. what I was going to say too, is because you go to MI controls and buy most of those valves. 
Yeah. <clears throat> so like out at Jefferson Tower, over the you know the hospital, they have all those BADs with hot water, twenty four volt actuator with that valve that has the CV rating stamped on it. So the first time I swapped one of those out, he was like, "What CV rating do you need?" Uh, yeah, that's important to know. <laughs> but generally, there's a chain on there with a tag, and it'll have a bunch of numbers, and it'll say like 2.31 CV. And that's what I did. I went back and, yeah. like you said, right on the body, there's a CV rating. Yeah. Because if, if, if you like get the wrong CV rating, it's, it's going to flow a different amount of water at that whatever pressure that building is. Either it's going to be too much or too little. That coil is illustrated like water too, so that counter flow you get that counter flow back. Yeah, it's a, I've seen a pipe throwing. Yeah, they oh, have sure. a pipe throwing. A, a lot of you guys are like, what the hell? You know, I'm just not getting Summertime comes, and it's just not getting that 50 degree. In winter, it's fine. Yeah, it's pipe back. Uh, this is a typical detail on a pump. Um, this would be somewhat ideal, where you have your shutoffs, uh, you have a drain down at the bottom, a strainer so you can service that drain, vibration isolators, Pete's plug, and a gauge of some kind. Generally, the reason that you'll see a lot of times, you'll see a gauge and a Pete's plug, or you'll see no gauge, because gauges go out of calibration. The idea is, is a lot of the, a lot of guys, a lot of mechanics, they don't trust gauges that are on equipment. They carry their gauges, you, you guys should, carry a good known working gauge. Don't trust what's on the equipment. So you can go out, you can take your calibrated, your nice new glycerin-filled vented Gauge bouncing around in your truck, and you're in the in the otter box case or pelican. Plug it in that Pete's plug, and you got a true reading versus some gauge that was put on an install and is now 15 years old. If that valve the gauge off, I pull them out to zero. Just I mean, it doesn't say that it's perfect, but at least if it goes to yeah. zero, you put it back on. As long as you're not twisting the body, because you can twist the body, make it think of a 20. Put it on with a wrench. And then put pressure to it, and then it goes up to 40. All right, at least I know I have pressure. At it's least it's 40. zero. Yeah, yeah, zeroing isn't calibrating, but at least it's something. Because otherwise, well, you pull it off and it stays at 20. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But that's the whole point of Pete's plugs. That's why you'll see Pete's plugs and no gauges, because a lot of guys don't trust the gauges that are on equipment. Hmm. So I have to go buy a set of gauges. Why? You should get some nice ones. Yeah. I think I have oh, one in my van. Everybody it's should have a Pete's plug adapter and, and a, and a no, couple of different sizes of Pete's plug. Needles, though. Have you seen that? Yeah. Get the smaller one because yeah. it fits the bigger. Right. Construction diffusers. Yeah, I was oh, born with the final. Minimum apply to my timers. You can use uh, such diffusers that they don't lose, right? For <laughs> suction pumps. Well, yeah, this is so you get what's called laminar flow, this five pipe diameters. So if you come down to an elbow and then go right in, it causes turbulence. So they're just calling that out. This, this was probably geared more towards people that are designing systems, but it's good to know that if you have a pump that's underperforming and it comes right down and goes right into the thing, you probably get some turbulence, possibly set yourself up for cavitation. That's what engineers like to see. They like to see this minimum five pipe diameters. So they, yeah. Yeah, it's exactly. Yeah, yeah it's, you don't see that very often. Because I'm thinking Continental, they might be right. Yeah, is it suction diffusers they're minding into, or is it? But aren't some of the pumps with a strainer? Now they can, they can no, catch, catch, catch a rat. They're being super big holes. Yeah, they're 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 there are some suction diffusers. Diffusers, I don't know. I, my initial thought is you still need some suction as a straight pipe, but I don't know if you need five or not. Um, this is this is being an ideal candidate for that triple duty valve that we looked at earlier. Because here we have balancing, we have a check valve and a shutoff. Triple duty valve combines all three of those into one nice little package that sits on the top. But if you didn't have that, you'd have these three on there. I threw this in just because not everybody understands what a hot water circulation loop is. Uh, this is, of course, residential, or it'd be very light commercial. But hot water recirc loop, so that when you turn a faucet on to heat, wherever it's at in the house or the building, you get instant hot water. That's what this is. So your hot water comes out and it hits all your faucets. But instead of just going one and then the next and ending, they all connect. And then it continues. And then it comes back into this recirc pump and it dumps into the bottom of the tank. That way, this faucet here that's at the very end of the loop, there's always hot water available. When you open it up, there's hot water. Common on bigger houses, of course, buildings. 
A lot of times they have an aquastat right here. So when this aquastat hits, say, 115 degrees, it shuts the pump off. And then when it drops below 115, the pump turns back on, pulls water back through it until it's 115 and it turns off. Let's say that you were going to want to do that at your house, just for example. Oh, well, I have it in my driveway. Yeah, right, right, right. And it's already, you're right, you got it. you'd have to run from your furthest yeah. whatever. Right. To do it properly, you link them all. <coughs> the poor man's way is you can go to Home Depot, you go to your furthest faucet, you and put you this funky, little three -way thing and it right. runs it back through the cold. It runs the hot water back. Can you draw that up really quick? <laughs> <laughs> that, but it is a way, and so that's what you do. No, because I'm honestly, because I got that. Tankless water heater, right? Yeah. I just haven't installed it yet. And you need it. You're gonna. I mean, you, with yeah. those, it's pointless to have one without it. Yeah. So I, but I did hear about that little yeah. thing. You can add it. Your trailer Yeah, it's a little. <laughs> but I was thinking, shit, I could pillage the copper from, you know, it's one of my neighbors' side jobs. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other way is, if you run it back through the cold. But if your house is like spidered out. If you do it on this one, it doesn't help these. But if you have like a, a long house and it, it just trunks off, then that'd be a good scenario to do it at the bot at the end. And but then you don't get cold water. So that's the downside is that if you open that faucet, you're not going to get cold water. You're going to get recent the toilets are probably going to flush hot. Yep. It'll make everything. It smells really. Is good. that <laughs> is that even legal? Hot water in your toilets? I don't think that's illegal. Why? I don't know. There's an air gap. You're not gonna. We can do a plumbing class next. Yeah, but you're filling your with hot your, water. Your tank up with hot water when you flush it. Yeah, I don't think you can do that. Why not? Well, no. Yes, you would get some. Don't but you have a heated toilet seat? Use the hot water. But if you didn't put it. that research on your toilet, which you would. What how? What do you run the dirt? You always get hot. To, you get hot to your toilet. You would, yeah, you would because you're running it back. So if you're your toilet, toilet one of your valves fail at like Continental Place, yeah, right? you got hot in the cold. Yeah, you yeah, it. But in this, you're, you but in this you're doing it on purpose. Right. You're doing it on purpose. So well, uh, let me think about it. We can draw yeah, that pretty easy. Draw that up. We'll have to enter for that. Um, I threw this in there just so some guys kind of understood how how uh, chillers are kind of. It's just like a pump, basically, in, in that you can go series or par parallel. So in a parallel oops, with a chiller, you're bringing in a 54, you're splitting it, putting out a 44, and away you go. Um, you have twice the capacity of one, so you have two. Some places that want really cold water, chilled water, they'll do two chillers in series. And put 64 in, drops to 54, drops to 44. Or you can bypass them, but generally series, you're not going to bypass them. I don't think you just have a bigger chiller. Real redundancy. Redundancy and, and modulation. You could you, so when you only need half the load, you can run one at full, or you can bring the next one on to modulate up. Show off, rebuild it a little bit. Yeah. But there's more involved in series piping. Uh, oh, than just yeah. that. <laughs> well, I don't expect you. You don't see too many of them in series. You, you got to see a lot of series pipe chillers. Oh, that's my first job. You draw that guy. Like, <laughs> and you'll draw that. Uh, <laughs> this is kind of your basic chilled water loop. Um, Maybe in like there. Hot condenser water goes up to the tower, comes back down, and goes to your barrel. Pretty simple. Uh, one chiller, one chilled water air handler. That's all that is. Um, nothing real to it. As you get into bigger stuff, um, you may have dedicated towers for each chiller. Um, not as common, but it does happen. Each chiller has its own tower, they're not connected. But they'll be manifolded on this side so that they each can control a, an air handler. The more common way is if you have two chillers, you're going to manifold everything so that you can shut one tower down. You can, you can isolate it, work on a tower while either one of the chillers runs. But they did build a lot of buildings back in the day where each, like you had one chiller and you had a tower. You had a chiller, you had a tower. You, they didn't mix for whatever reason. This is the more the common way. <clears throat> and then you can shut one chiller down for rebuild, like Matt mentioned, and everything's headed together, um, isolates. Just getting back to the series, you, you guys might end up seeing these because they're they they hit leads for a while with those, and we had um, 
Johnson Controls had a <coughs> big hard on for putting those in. And what it is, yeah. What they'll do is they'll put a small chiller. That's the that's the pre-cooling, so they don't have to run the energy to have the chilled water loop with the high demand. So they'll pre-cool and then run that through the primary chillers here, secondary and primary chiller. And they thought that was going to work real good, but there was always pump issues. Always. We put four of those after being there about 10 years, we ended up putting four of them back to Fairwash. What I wanted to get at with those slides is there's this thing called a hydraulic decoupler bridge. These are in more buildings than you realize. They're real common on cooling towers too that have a constant, constant pump on um, for like a, uh, if you have like a, it has a condenser water. What this is, is if you, you generally you're going to have constant volume pumps running through the condenser or through the chilled water of, of a building. So if these pumps, if this pumping through this primary loop is greater than the demands of the building loop, as these things slow down, this water takes the path of least resistance and the water flows this way. Well, if the opposite's true, if these things are ramping up or they don't have the capacity at the moment to meet the water demands of the building, these guys will suck water and it changes directions. It's called a hydraulic decoupler bridge. You guys ever seen that? Yeah. It's more common than you know. And when you have a primary is it just, is, I mean, is it piping? Would you know? Yeah. Would gates you know of, by looking at it? No, I mean, or gates like, is sort of that. Yeah, they have a sticker that's because they, they, they have the primary, secondary, right. and it oh, can go either way. And I think right. if you look at the allergen graphics, the there's one pipe that has an arrow up and an arrow down, and that's what it is. It's a hydraulic decoupler. Or at least it changes valves, yeah. and then it doesn't. So, yeah, that's just called a hydraulic yeah. decoupler bridge. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. That's a picture like, right there. Like, it's just, it's just, just, just a pipe. It's just a pipe. It's just a pipe. It's just a pipe. Yeah. yeah. So, like, like I said, it was I was walking around with the sticker. But, like the see, the thing is, these chillers don't like to have varying flow through them. Like they like to have a constant flow. So now there are ways around that on on some of the systems, but for the vast majority of chillers, they like a constant flow. So what they'll do is they'll vary the flow out here. The demands of the building varies, but the chiller loop stays the same. So that's why they have that decoupler bridge there. So that as these guys ramp down, this water has somewhere to go, so it can continue. That's your that's your term for the day. It's I guess I pass. decoupler bridge. The other way to do that, which is the same thing, is instead of having two sets of pumps like this, engineers will save money and put in one set of pumps. And that one set of pumps does not only your chiller, your chilled water here, but it also does out here. And then this can do the same thing. If you need more water flow out here, you can open up this valve or close the valve, and that water continues over here. If you need less flow out here, you can close that down, and it'll uh, and you open it up, and the water comes this way. Or, or, or you might see that control valve on like a heating. Right, yep. where, where those chillers would be boilers. Yep. They maintain that loop at say like 130. 40, yeah, 130, and then that valve opens as those radiators start to pull heat. Yep. So what Marcus is talking about, if you if you were to picture these as boilers, you know what non-condensing versus condensing boiler is. So it, uh, yeah, a non-condensing boiler has a, a flue stack temperature that's generally four or five hundred degrees. Air, air comes in, mixes with the fuel, gets lit, goes to the boiler, and comes out super hot. Like your hot water heater in your house. Or if you were to get a 95% high efficient furnace at home. That'd be a condensing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if it's those, PVC, yeah. it's high efficient. If you have condensing, you're, you're pulling so much heat out of those flue gases that the moisture condenses out of it. And, and you can vent it in PVC, like Marcus said. Well, if you have a non-condensing boiler, if you have a boiler that's not made to condense, you don't want to be dumping cold water into it because that cold water hits the heat exchanger and it's going to condense. It's not made to do that. So generally, your your lower temperature is going to the lowest you want coming into a boiler is 130. So what Marcus was saying is maybe you put a bypass in here, so this water comes out and it can circulate 
and you, you would modulate this valve so when it mixes this hot water here cold with this start? return water. Cold start? No, not really. No. You'd modulate these two so that the water coming back is above 130 to keep it from condensing. We'll get more into that in the boiling class. Yeah, I just learned that a few weeks ago from that. Yeah. Yeah, it's <laughs> important to know. All right, you guys ready to talk about pumps? Good stuff? Talk about head? Yeah, love CFM. Uh, those are two common terms in pumping. Capacity is, is uh, measured in gallons per minute. That's capacity. That's how much you're pumping through, gallons per minute. Pretty simple, right? And then there's head. Head is head pressure. It's feet of head. It's the it's the top. It's the top. Instead of going on psi, it's it's measured in feet of head. So instead of saying like this was 56 psi, we were talking down here. You wouldn't say 56 psi. You'd say 110 feet of head. That's how a lot of pumps are are rated. And what that means is a pump will. Say if this pump is rated at 20 feet ahead. You'll see it in condensate pumps all the time. They're rated for 12 feet. It means it can pump up 12 feet. It can take a standing volume of water, suck it in, and push it 12 feet. That's, that's what that means. If it's a bigger pump, maybe it's 20 feet. It's a really, really big condensate, maybe 30 or 40 feet. But that's, that's what it, it's just feet. It's 12 inches. That's all that is. So... If this pump here is rated at 10 feet ahead, if you turn this thing on and you just connect a hose that goes to nowhere, you allow it to suck water in, it'll pump that up to that 20 feet of head that it's rated for, and then it stops. It just can't, can't push it any higher. That's what a pump does. It creates a pressure differential. That water goes up so high and it stops. But if you were to raise the water level of that sump, well, now your baseline is the top of the water. So you have all this water weight here pushing down into your suction side. So that increases how far you can push up, right? Because you got water weight pushing into the suction side, so it raises how far you can push up. And if you were to raise that, if you were to raise that up even taller, so this is now your zero line, you can push up even taller. So what we're getting at is that when you have a closed loop, all you're doing is you're fighting the friction loss through a building. If you have a pump down here, that pump doesn't have to be rated to push the water up to the top of the building. All it, because it's got water coming back down, it's got water weight on the suction side. All it has to do is circulate. It doesn't have to pump up there. So putting a putting a, a pump at the bottom of the building or the top of the building, it doesn't matter. It's just all it's doing is pumping it in a closed loop. It's just a pressure differential. The difference is on an open loop. On an open loop, you have to, your water levels down here, you see a picture of cooling tower? Picture a big cooling tower. Your sump's down here, but your spray bar might be 20 feet in the air. Well, that's what this is. So you have to, your pump has to be rated to pump all the way up to the top here. But then it's not getting the water weight till down here. So those have to be rated different for open loops versus closed loops. Because you're not dealing with just friction loss, you're dealing with overcoming that head. That's, this is how booster pumps have to operate too. Because booster pumps don't have, they don't have that water coming back from the top of a building to help them out. They have water coming in from the street. Does that make sense? That's, that's how pumps, that's how pumps and closed loops and open loops operate. So would you have different pumps in those two different situations or are you going to see like that's, a higher amp draw in the open situation? They'd be completely different. Because this pump here isn't made to overcome this void. It's not made to pump up to the top. Right. Like this one is. This one would be rated at a higher it's, head. It's made a bigger pump. Yeah, or it's got a different pump curve, which we'll talk about. We'll talk about pump curves in a few minutes. So like in this one here, to figure your, so eight, your, this is your, your suction head is your HS. That's this guy. That's your water weight coming into it. Your discharge head is your HD, and that's this. They're equal to each other. It's like a big Ferris wheel. Like a Ferris wheel, you don't have to, you don't have to have a big motor that lifts up the people because you have the weight of the people coming <coughs> back down. Same with an elevator. An elevator, you have a car full of people, but you have counterweights. The motor at the top, all it's doing is just moving the thing. It doesn't have to like lift that whole elevator car. 
it's got a counterweight. Well, that's what that water does, is it acts as a counterweight. So the pumps do quite a bit less work than you think in a closed loop. All I have to do is create a pressure differential. Gravity does the rest. So a closed loop is way more efficient than From a pumping standard, yeah. Because you don't have to pay to pump it up past higher than your suction line. See, right here, you have help from here down. But this has to overcome this head, this head loss right here. This HU, it's called an unbalanced head. And the position of the pumps, whether it's top or bottom. <clears throat> well, yeah, because if, if your pump was up above, you'd have to you'd have to suck the water up. Yeah. So, you can put, in other words, you put a close to the pump on top. You can't put it over the pump on top and go down. But, yeah, there's some things to consider, but yeah, the takeaway is that that's I mean, you're not like I as an apprentice, I always thought pump a pump in the basement on like a hot water loop had to pump that water all the way to the top. Well, it's not. It's getting all that help from the suction side coming back down. All it does is create a pressure differential. So, all the gravity system with hot water, though, that does what well, pumping effect, just like convection was there. Yeah, the water actually rises up and then it goes back down. Yeah, yeah. Heat up the point where it goes down. yeah. That, yeah that's the yeah, thermal. So, speaking of pumps, because we're getting into that, um, this is that net positive suction head. We kind of talked about this earlier. Um, every pump has a design pressure that has to come into it. Because if you don't maintain above the net positive suction head, you can get cavitation. And what cavitation is, is <laughs> it's bubbles forming in the liquid. So if you have hot water, this, this is the eye of the impeller. This is the, this is a pump here. This is the eye of the impeller. In the system, the lowest pressure in the system is at the eye of the impeller. This is the lowest that there is in that system. So if you have hot water, say you're, you have 205 degree water on a boiler loop, and you don't have enough pressure coming into that suction side of the pump, you can get a vacuum that forms there. The water can start boiling and it flashes off into steam. And steam is just like this thing says, vapor bubbles form at the inlet of the pump and are moved to the discharge side of the pump where they collapse, often taking small pieces of the pump with them. And then cavitation is often characterized by a loud noise described as grinding or marbles. You guys heard that before in a pump? I know Matt has. I What's know that I sound have. like? Huh? What's that sound like? Grinding or marbles. <laughs> <laughs> Can you wait to make Grinding it or marbles. <laughs> <laughs> Loss of capacity. So if you got pump cavitation, your pump's doing all this work moving the bubbles. It's not moving the water like it's supposed to. Those are taking up the space. So you generally have low flow if you got cavitation. A lot of times that's the sick. You, that's the initial call is that something's not moving water like it's supposed to. Coils aren't cold enough or whatever that is. You go up and you hear the pump. Or my bearings are bad. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> but it's cavitation. And then pitting damage to parts of the material. Those bubbles are they're they're hard on stuff. Like they actually will eat into eat into the impellers. I know I've seen them replace some impellers in the time. I know Matt has. So, um, are you gonna hear the marble sound before you see the pressure loss? Generally, if you're if you have a good gauge on there. You should have it probably marked where it's supposed to be, so maybe somebody can see it. But normally, somebody notices it. Either there's not pre there's not heat getting somewhere, or somebody walks by it and they hear it. They hear that gravelly sound or the marble sound. That's generally the first indication versus pressure. You put a gauge on the uh, inlet of a spray pump on the side of the cooling tower. What do you think it would be? Um, Given the pressure, pulling it outside. You know whatever whatever inches that we're pushing on it in the section. So you have 25 to one pound at the most. Like the pumps are basically on big red ones, but those suction run at like no. two. Uh, <laughs> you will look at them and the gauge is all damn near zero. Which is fine. There are yeah. pumps with because you're you're not and this is where it gets kind of abstract, but. If you have a gauge sitting here like that, that Pete's plug gauge, it says zero. Well, that's zero gauge. There's there's a difference. There's gauge pressure and there's absolute pressure. 
that zero gauge is actually equal to 14.7 psi of absolute. Absolute. <laughs> what? At sea level. 14.6 at sea level. At sea level. At sea level. At sea level. <laughs> so even though you see zero or you see a little slight negative, it's not really a negative. It's negative to, to absolute. It gets kind of abstract. I didn't want to get into that because I don't really but know. But you can run it. I have pumps that run negative. You can. And there's yeah. there's pumps that are that have a rating for a, for a net positive suction head in in that negative range. Yeah. But they have to be designed for. If it's if it's chilled water and it's running and it's uh, cavitating or you have a mass of restriction, you'll have chilled water, but you'll feel the pump and it starts getting really really warm. If you get there late. Because you're got sealed instead of the energy of water inside the eye. Instead of the energy <clears throat> being transferred to the water and being pumped, it's being transferred into churning the water and the seal eventually heat. steam. It's not being cool. So if you hear that or you take a pump apart, it'll make this pitting. You'll look at it, it's pretty apparent. Looks like somebody hit it with a hammer a bunch, or there's just pieces missing or rusted or rotted. When they get real bad, they they start looking like that. I've seen them close to that before. Generally, that's going to be a bronze impeller, but they get pretty eaten away. It's plastic. You think it's plastic? I don't know. It looks like it. I think it's bronze. Usually, those plastic ones. They just shatter. They disintegrate. Yeah. Anyways. They don't last that long. Why is there no water over here? So, and actually, Matt just hit on a good thing, diagnosing cavitation. So, if you don't already install a good, a good quality gauge, like this compound type gauge on it, that'll show you a little bit of positive, but also negative. So you know exactly where you're at. Try to put that as close to the inlet as possible. So if there's a volute on this, try to put it right on the volute as close as you can, you know, to the inlet. So you can actually see what that suction pressure is. And then from that, that tells you your net positive suction head available in PSHA. And then you have to get hold of the pump manufacturer, or some have some will say. That's what I was going to ask you. Are they stamped on the name? Some plate? are. Not all, not most, but some are. They'll have an NPSH. Especially at PACO. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, I would go straight to Google and look. One of, our, one of our guys tell us that find gauges like way up on like a suction line or a down here, oh, way over here, and these two pressure gauges that were just installed randomly. Maybe a foot away from the pump, you tell you know what that's for? That's for my jacket. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, compare that to what you're supposed to have, and, and then you can start taking steps to remedy it. Uh, if your net positive suction head available is less than you're required, then you have cavitation. That's all there is to it. That's where your noise is coming from. So then you got to figure out a way to do something with it. So. The easiest is to raise the net positive suction head available. That's the goal, is to get that pressure up. So increase the suction pressure. If your pumps are up here and you're filled, if you're not getting enough water up there, you don't have enough pressure in your loop, that's probably what needs to happen, is to raise that up. I know we had that at Hotel 1000 for a while, get enough pressure in that loop. Uh, try to slow the pump down, because if you slow it, you're going to increase the suction pressure. It'll come up a little bit because you're not pulling on that water so hard. So if you can slow the pump down a little bit, maybe it doesn't need to work as hard as it is, you'll uh, you'll remove that cavitation. Um, you can make the pump bigger. It doesn't have to run as fast. So that's one way to do it. Um, and by making a pump bigger, that's not always a new pump. That could be a bigger impeller. A lot of impellers are trimmed. You guys have heard of that, right? Trimming the impeller. No? Yep. We'll talk a little bit about it. but. These pumps are generally made with a fixed size impeller, and then they get trimmed down on a lathe by a machine shop based on what the engineer actually specs. So it does happen where you got to trim an impeller. It's too big, it's moving too much water, it's pulling too much amps, or whatever, because there are problems with being oversized. And the size stamped on the pump is not always what's inside the pump. Yeah, and, that, and when we get into pump curves, we're just going to touch on that a little bit, but yeah. A lot of times on your nameplate, it might say, you know, well, I don't know, seven, six, seven inch impeller. Somebody may have trimmed it down. But you get a pump curve because you want to figure out exactly what this pump's doing, but you're looking at the wrong curve because the pump, the impeller's been mis missized or you been can, trimmed. And how do you, how do you know? You right? close you the discharge, you measure, measure it. Well, you close the discharge, measure the 
pressure and then compare that to the, 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 the published literature. You're actually, Doug is, is exactly right. Is, yeah, Can you say that again? You, you, you close off the discharge and there's a calculation you can do is you take that pressure that it develops, you minus the suction pressure from it because the suction is helping push it. So you have to you have to remove that from the equation. But a bigger impeller is gonna is gonna give you more pressure than a smaller impeller. And that's on that that's on that curve. So there's and ways you'd to be able to look up at the nameplate and tell it we should tell you. There's a line that several lines that will show what size that yeah. impeller is based on that pressure yeah. and that suction pressure difference. Yeah. Otherwise you gotta pull it and measure the impeller. It's pretty accurate. I've done it a couple of times, pulled the impellers, yeah. and it's fairly accurate. Yeah. Absolutely. They're going to come in inches. They're not going to be any fractions of an inch, I don't think, right? But they're all based no, on. No, they're well, no, there's, there's fractions. Lots right? of fractions, yeah. So there's a pump curve. This is a very simplistic pump curve. But all pumps are designed to throw water up in the air. So head, that's to pump up. And to pump water. So up and out. But they fight each other. So up along this side, this is generally called your, your shutoff or your valve close line, your total head line. If you close off the discharge valve, and I know there's no numbers, but that's to make it a little easier. If you close off the valve, you'll develop the most amount of pressure out of that pump. So pumps have what's called a curve. As you come out, so if, you have the, if, if you're not moving any water, that pump creates its maximum pressure. But as you start to open that valve, you start increasing your gallons per minute, right? Because now you're starting to move water. So as you start moving water, you start moving along this line. Well, you can see you start dropping off. So the more water we move, the farther it can throw that. So if you only move, need to move a little bit of water, but you need to move it way up in a building, well, this pump here, this curve can do it. But like anything else, you always want to run in the middle of the pump curve, just like a gauge, just like a boiler, just like anything. They like things like to run more in the middle of, of what they're designed instead of one extreme or the other. So if this had numbers on it, which I got one coming up, but if this had numbers, if this was 100 feet ahead and this was 100 gallons a minute, if you need to move 50 gallons per minute at 50 feet, you would go 50 feet, 50 50 feet here, come over 50 gallons per minute. Well, that curve doesn't match. This pump can't do that. That's what a pump curve is. It's to plot out how many gallons per minute, how many feet. Every pump has a curve. It's a mathematical, it's just what it does. And there's, there's what's called flat pump curves and, and uh, steep pump curves. The difference is this flat pump curve, you can, you can change the gallons per minute quite a bit and it can still pump it at the same amount of distance up in a building. It has the same amount of head, even if you vary the GPM. So as you close valves or open valves, it's still gonna maintain its, its pressure coming out. Whereas this one here, the steep pump curve, as you change the GPM, you change drastically the amount of head. Because here, you come over where these two intersect, you're moving GPM about here, about this head. But if you need to lower that GPM down, well, now you're over here. If you raised up that much. And just like it explains over here, is a flat pump curve, head varies slightly as flow changes. Steep pump curve, head varies significantly as flow changes. So there's different curves for different applications. A booster pump is going to have a very different curve than a boiler pump that's just pumping around in a circle. Booster pumps are made to go to pump really high up in a building. This is kind of the same thing. It's just saying that, well, I liked that, the desirable head course, but very steep, there's very steep ones. And some pumps actually, as you add GPM, they'll actually increase the amount of work they can do shooting up into a building, shooting up in, in, in uh, vertical rise to feed a bit versus some that just kind of taper off all the time. That's what a pump curve is. If you're used to seeing a, like a fan curve, it's kind of the same thing. They're all published data for what they can do. It's so that engineers can, can do what they need. But if, if you have a pump that's cavitating, you can get the pump curve for it. 
And a lot of times they'll have an NPSH on down at the bottom. So you can see what that NPSH is compared to exactly the GPM and the feet ahead you're doing and see where you're at in the pump curve. Maybe you're really high to the left. Maybe you're really far to the right. You want to be more in the middle. You might have the wrong pump, but that's where you trim an impeller. This one was interesting. This is a really common scenario where you have two pumps side by side. One of the rules of thumb that I always went off of was, how do you know if it's supposed to be one pump running or both all the time? Are they lead leg or are they supposed to be running together redundancy? The general rule is look at the pipe size coming into it. If the pipe that feeds both pumps is the same size as both pumps going in, those are made to run independently. If you have a big header, a big feed pipe up above and it comes down and goes to smaller pipes at each pump, those are made to run together. So if you ever see that, that's kind of the rule. So if you plot that out on a pump curve, say that these two are made to run together, when you have two pumps in parallel like this, your head's going to be the same. You can't pump it up farther, farther up a riser just because you have two pumps in parallel. But you're going to double your GPM. So that's what a double pump, a parallel pump, looks like on a pump curve. Versus if you have it in series, you're feeding into one, feeding into the next. That isn't that common, but it does happen. That's what it looks like on a pump curve. Your GPM is the same, but you're doubling your head. There's one, and there's two. That's what it looks like on a pump curve. Yeah. And this is what it looks like if you have a variable speed pump or multi-speed. This would be your fastest speed, 100% operation. You can see you got this nice big pump curve. You got your you got your highest amount of head and your highest GPM. And as you slow that thing down, you lose your GPM and you lose your head. I just kind of like the graphics so you can kind of get an idea of what a pump curve looks like at, at different speeds. This is kind of the craziest one. Um, this is kind of what Doug was talking about. This shows you impeller sizes. This is all the same pump. This is the same pump with an 11 inch impeller. What's that? Probably 8 and 7 eighths, or 10 and 7 eighths, and then 9 inch. So you can see as you get smaller, that pump curves, you lose a little bit of head, and you're losing a little bit of GPM each time. So that's the same pump, just different. But then, see, it also costs you less than horsepower. So you can plot out your health horsepower usage also based you on those different up ones. with horsepower? Huh? You round up with horsepower? Uh, yeah, I don't know. So, well, when you go to the three times size, um, and I think, I think there's, there's problems with overestimating your pump yeah. size. So I think you try to probably try to get as close as you can. I don't know. But you'll, sometimes you'll fall between uh, 20 or 25. And you can probably round up. As long as your power is okay. I don't you know that? Do you round up or down? I would go up with horsepower. I, mean, yeah, I would always go up a little bit. All right. We're almost done. We're going to finish this out with some centrifugal pumps. That's what we got to build outside. Sweet. I got some parts. We're going to build some pumps. <laughs> so all these pumps, they all operate the same. Whether it's this thing on like a little, whatever the motor this is. Okay. There's a suction. There's a centrifugal uh, impeller in there, and there's a discharge off the top. When these things spin, they basically throw water out. And that creates a high pressure inside the balloon. Well, if you create a high pressure on one side, you're going to create a low pressure on the other. And it's that pressure differential that drives them. Whether it's a small pump like that, or it's one of these giant pumps, where you got, it's the same. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same principle. That's the biggest one I can find on Google. And there's probably bigger, but um, it's, it's, a, yeah, it's the same damn thing. It's just a centrifugal impeller with an eye. Probably, probably New Orleans or something, one of the dikes. It might be. Those yeah. Are, yeah. They use those screw pumps. To, to it's a great wolf pump. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a what? It's a great wolf pump. Great wolf pump. <laughs> so this You're is the basic stuff. design yeah. of the centrifugal. This is the eye. This is your impeller. As it spins, it flings the water out. That creates high pressure on the outside of the impeller, which in turn creates low pressure on the inside. That's the pressure differential, just like everything else. Everything's pressure differential. It's a differential, whether it's temperature or pressure or whatever. Uh, it kind of drives all everything. Uh, we're creating that pressure differential. Water goes out. 
this is kind of a crappy picture, but I like the illustration. Um, this shows the same thing. This is the eye of the impeller, is always your inlet. Yeah, this is the end suction. That's your discharge there with the impeller. Um, this one shows the wear rings. These volutes are generally just cast. They don't have like machining in them. So they'll put brass wear rings in them. And that's there so that if these bearings, if these bearings start going bad, this impeller can hit the wear ring rather than, than hitting like steel. But the other part is those wear rings create a tighter fit inside that volute because they're not machined. But not every pump comes with a wear ring. You have to contact the manufacturer. I've been bit by that before. You take a pump apart and there's no wear ring. You think somebody left it out. I called the manufacturer. They say, no, it didn't ship with it. It was optional. So if you ever open up a pump and there's no wear ring, don't just assume somebody left it out. And then, so this is the shaft. This is your shaft seal. And then that's a water slinger. So when that shaft seal fails, that water just doesn't shoot back into this load. This is a standard like boiler water cert pump. You've probably seen these, Bell and Gossett, also known as the Series 100. This is that coupling. Has anybody ever changed one of these yeah. four spring couplings? Get rid of those spiraling them. That is 100%. <laughs> we didn't say that. Where's my? There it is. A spiraling coupling. So this is this is what Bell and Gossett ships them with. This is called a four spring coupling. They're a pain in the ass to put in. They're noisy. And they have all these wear points. There's eight wear points in there for these springs. So they just they don't last well, they last longer, but they last they're they're noisy and they got their own issues. Plus they're kind of a bitch to install. Because like that, like that showed, if you've never done one, this is the coupling here. You have to fight between this pump and this motor, generally with a long handled T Allen wrench, to get in there and like fight this thing onto the shaft on one end. One end you can attach before you bolt this thing back together, but the other one's kind of a bitch. Oh, you know, when it breaks, yeah. <laughs> I've had a pump yeah. I couldn't get to. Did it sound like it's <laughs> really bad for me. I was like, oh, looks yeah. like we got a new pump. This is the other option. Look at it. Oh, He's been okay. around quite a while. This is called a spiraling. This takes the place of that. I've seen those on some of the points over there. These are way easier to install. They last longer. There's no moving parts. They don't have any wear points to them. This is the smallest one. This is the most common. Half inch in, half inch out. You have to decouple to get that on there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because there's a more case of right out. Yeah. Okay. But they also have these bigger, and they have with a sleeve in there, so you can pop it out. It can be 5 eighths or it can be half inch. Um, one thing of note that I didn't know. That when this thing turns, the spring should be sucked in. You turn it one way, it collapses and gets smaller. You turn it the other way, it expands out. So they do sell these in counterclockwise and clockwise. So if you ever had a question of which one do I have, when it turns in the proper direction, the spring gets smaller, it collapses. So when you play with it, you don't. And you'll, get there. Huh? you'll get there. No. Seems like you just. Yeah, you can't. Can't. Yeah. So on the end of this thing, these are super common. So if you've never worked on one of these, what direction is it coming? I'm just talking about that. I meant to be able to flip that the other way. No. So, so, so instead of it going two sets on each side. Okay. Yeah. 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 Pretty sure it's going the same way, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Going yeah. Same way. Um, these things here, this so this is the volute. This gets mounted into the piping. You guys have probably seen these. These have been around for like 80 years. When these things leak, this is a this is where the seal's at right here. When they leak, water runs out the back and onto the floor. When you replace these, this volute part stays in the piping. You don't take that out. You take out this part called the bearing assembly. The bearing assembly is this beauty right here. Right. This is the one I took out yesterday. Huh? Is that the one I took out yesterday? Yeah, you threw it in the scrap bin, it is. <laughs> I pulled it out this morning. I was so excited. <laughs> yeah. So when these things leak, yeah, they do. this is the water side here. 
There's an impeller on there. You didn't see all the way Yeah, you put the, the gas on there. Cool. Yeah, so no, I put that back on there, yeah. This seal leaks right here. This one you get, it's got some play to it. Some of them get worse. So what you do is you don't try to rebuild these things. You can always replace it. Now, this is a little bit bigger than, than the Series 100, but it's the same exact principle. This would have that coupling on it, that same one. This is a half-inch shaft. So the way you have to do it is you have to put it on one end and then put this to the motor and try to reach in there with your long handle T, or put it on the motor and then put this on. It's kind of a bit. You said it's so that divot is close to where you're going to get to the slop, and then you can go. Yeah, there's a divot in the shaft. This thing's tight, man. Uh, there's a divot in the shaft, so you have to kind of line those up. Um, when these things, when you install them, they all have oil ports on it. Well, the new ones don't. They're sealed bearings. Oh, well, yeah. for the last 70 years, so you probably see one. Yeah. I've seen these before. People put them in upside down, the whole thing. And then the oil, you can't oil them. So when you do it, try to make note of where that oil port is. They all come with a new little bell and gossip tube of oil, and it has lines for how much oil you put in it. It'll say like the first one is for this, which is the most, and then there's a little bit for the front bearing, which is a front bearing, and then there's a back bearing. One, two, and three. Yep, one, two, and three. So that's what that is. That's called a bearing assembly. When you go to Griffin or wherever, you just take a picture of this nameplate. They can cross reference this to Bell and Gossett or Armstrong, but Armstrong, whatever. Um, but always replace the bearing assembly. Always get that in place, but then get the motor info too, because sometimes they're with them. I did ask for horsepower. In it. One thing too on that, um, you reuse the impeller. Like these don't ship with an impeller, and you can't always get the impeller the same day. So, did you get a new impeller? Did you no, reuse it? It was fine. Most people reuse them. Oh, some, some are plastic. Some are yeah, metal. Some are brass. Yeah. I was debating to go back and get a brass one, but I didn't. Yeah. Plastic on that one? yeah, it was in good condition though. So I'm, I'm curious. You take that that off. What kind of is it? Just the pressure from these nuts? I don't need that. Yeah. The bolt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or is there like some sort of set screw that you stick it on there? You put the nuts and bolts on. You stick it on the handle T and just tighten it up. So, so yeah, the like, oh, this, this, yeah. this is the where the impeller yeah. goes on this side. So what's keeping this into the impeller? Your blue section that your whole right. impeller would slide in. Yeah, this yeah. Bolts would but go. Yeah. So look what's, at this. What's it's connecting the, the impeller to this? To oh, this well, this is not right here. That's oh, a so nut. This goes in. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I, I put that piece of or you can glue it. Okay. The impeller goes there. Where was he saying that it leaves? Out the ass end of this one. Really through the seal. Yeah. Right through here. Exactly. And then coming in on the floor, and there's like, yep. I call it everywhere. Yeah. Like, yep. Whoops. So we'll be see just signs of water leaking. leaking? No, no, no that'll run water. out there. Okay. It'll be pissing. Yeah. Yeah. So so you should be able to just stick a, just it's not a light down there and look, all right, it's pissing out some water right there. Yeah, oh, it's usually all over the floor. I had to get some kitty litter to clean it up. Yeah. It's fun. So the point, of, the only point of those things that we just passed around aren't for that. It's for when it's sealed and you want that. No, for that. That had one on it. Yeah. Kyle just did it yesterday. You put a spider link on it. No, it's got one of the. That's where your motor would connect to. And that's just explain the water where it saved the motor. No, that that that's the coupling between the motor and the pump. So yeah. motors on this side, the colors on this side. What are they connected to? It's just the way it is, man. It looks just like that. Yep. That's serious. So this is the blue part. That is right. the blue part. Yeah. That's the bearing assembly. Yeah. Once in a while, you get guys that try to rebuild those. Don't fuck with it. Yeah. They're not <laughs> just the bigger. Because they'll sell, you, they'll sell you the seal and the yeah. spring and the parts and to do it, but the labor to do it is insane because that's only 317 bucks. Yeah. Don't screw Out the them. door. And then you're liable and all that. Yeah. Don't and then it's going to leak, so it's just easier to replace the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. And on maintenance, are you putting oil in that? On maintenance, you should once a year put some oil in that. Some of these, and I don't know if that one does. Some of these have an oil. Yeah, 
better voice charts. Some of these will have the same. Some of these will have a hole on the side, and when you fill this thing up, you fill it until the oil comes just out the side, and that's how you. That's how you. That's what this one doesn't. Yeah, you just fill it fill it. So, like, so like this says, do not over lubricate. Uh, immediately fill with oil supplied half inch to insert a tip of oil cup and slowly squeezing. At the start of each following heating season, add 15 drops SAP30. So that's what it's called. So it's about mm -hmm. 15 drops. That's what it's called. The other engineers and <laughs> are they call you when they find the glycol on the ground. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, very assembly. I know it really well. <laughs> when you're uh, when you do it, you'll reuse the impeller generally. But it's always worth checking, just so you know, because if you go somewhere and get a get a new one of those, and then you get back and the impeller's all fucked up. Well, now you gotta go get an impeller too. Kyle, did you? And, and, and the other thing to note, if that if you're doing the pumps on domestic hot water, it shouldn't be plastic normally. It should be the brass one. Well, they can be plastic. Well, be yeah, plastic. but they it'll wear out. So when you pull that off, yeah. you, so you found that the yeah, uh, time, <laughs> and then you're like, oh, well, I, I, there's a leak there. But then, how did you know that that impeller was still good? I did. it. I took a chance. So <laughs> I took all the information and I drove down and yeah. I called this job. I went down there, picked it up, and he said, "Well, they." I said, "Is that?" A, I asked him. I said, "Is it a brass impeller in there or a plastic one?" And he's like, mm, "Yeah, so exactly." He's yeah. like, "Sometimes they're brass, and sometimes they're plastic." When I got back and yeah. took it apart, it was plastic, but it was in great well, shape. So yeah, they back. normally are. They're generally if they're in a closed loop, yeah, they just sit in there and run. They don't. Yeah. They're, it's rare to find one that's bad. That's sticking out. So I mean, if, of the expansion. Yeah, if it did turn out bad, you just <clears throat> pull that shit out and you're like, "Well, I got this." Yeah. Now. I mean, yeah, kind of shit out left, I'm not going to stick back in there anymore. The impeller? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, you can go find one or whatever. Yeah, go back. Call the shop and take the cow on. And, I, and if I'm going to replace it, I'm going to put a brass one in the house on it. Because it'll last forever. Shit, that's hard. Well, and back on domestic, too, because those, those, those are used as hot water research sometimes. They're pretty common to have those. Yes. In that, these, these are going to be brass. Or bronze, oh these God. volutes, because if it's just straight up domestic water, they're going to rust because it's untreated. So these are going to be, or stainless now. Now they're not even in titanium, too. But normally these are going to be brass. Do you know what the scrap price is on that titanium? Uh, 15 bucks a pound. <laughs> yeah. As of uh, this morning. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, keep that's that in mind. That's there, what Seth was doing over there. They, they, there is some old bearing assemblies that they have a stamped steel impeller, but those are only for heating. They're not for domestic water use. So just so you know. Uh, bearing assembly, yeah, so get that number. Generally, just take a picture of it. Call Griffin, call Jensco, Johnstone Supply, whatever, whoever you're, John, John Julian, wherever you're going. Uh, they'll give it. They give you the right one. Pretty simple. Spiraling. Now you know. Use that one. <clears throat> Inline pumps. Um, no coupling. Those are pretty common. We're gonna look at some of them. Um, basically, it's the same design as this close coupled pump. Close coupled pumps use a mechanical seal. How many of you have done seals in here? One or two. So doing pump seals are something you should be doing. Um, they're easy to do. Beats the hell out of humping that pump and motor downstairs when you can just do it up in a mechanical room. This picture is from a, a guide called US Seal Guide or something. I'll put it on the Dropbox. You guys can have it. We'll talk about that in a second. The most common seal is this Type D, but there are lots of other ones out there. This is called the Seal Head here, just so you know. And then there's mating rings. The mating rings go in the blue. We'll get into those a little bit more in just a minute. The most common is the cup mounted. That's this number one here. There's two different seals here. There's the primary seal, and that sits right here. I got one to pass around. 
These generally, when you buy them, they have two different material. There's a primary seal, that's on the head. That's this part here. That's the head with the spring behind it. And then there's the mating ring, as it's called. And that's the one that actually goes into the volute. They touch together like this. This one on the back is stationary because it's in the pump. This one rotates like this. A little bit of film of water in there is what creates the seal. As it spins, it doesn't allow the water to get into the into the shaft. We're going to cover that more in just a minute. Um, <clears throat> when you buy these at Griffin or whatever, they come with this buna. That's the rubber. That's the rubber in this of this material here, and that's the rubber that's inside this head that goes around the shaft. And we'll, I'll show you on that one in just a minute. Yeah. It's rated at 225, which seems high enough, but a lot of times that's your weak link is this Buta rubber. Because it doesn't, hot. it gets too hot, but it doesn't stand up to chemicals real well. So uh, glycol and, this, and the like. And so, the steam and all the cavitation. That's yeah. Right there at the top. For 20 bucks at Griffin, you can upgrade to Viton. And that gets you a new cup. That's this cup here that goes on the mating ring. They'll swap out the cup from the mating ring and they'll swap out the rubber inside the, the head, the seal head. For What's 20 it called? bucks. Viton? Viton? Yeah, right here. It's good to 400 and it's really good. Why don't they just have all of them at 400? As to some people, but if you're using just a condenser water pump, you must necessarily put it in the Probably not. <laughs> so, if you've never done a pump seal, which I didn't see a whole lot of hands going up, oh, I forgot to put mine on. So, if you come here and look before we take it completely apart, there'd be a pollute around here, right? So, this is whole water. You don't want the water getting out the back and coming outside of the piping, right? So that's what the pump seal is doing. Oh, oh shit. I don't have to. Oh, I don't have to that one. You forgot the hot sauce? There's a ton of stuff in there. So when you take that apart, right here, this spring is putting pressure on this primary ring. That's the primary seal. That stem. See how that spins like that? I got one. Hang on. See if you can work on it. Is anybody stuck in? Yeah, Casey's on there. At least he was. I don't know. I'm about to take out. a shower now. It probably rails. I don't know. You get it? <laughs> yeah, let me see that. Oh, shit, I had it out. Huh? I had it out earlier, so it should. Or. Do I get a chisel? <laughs> you wait, Justin. You wait. And you can't take your strainer away. Just call me. But people call me when they can't get the strainer away. Matt opens his with his hands. <laughs> I believe it. Fucking bear paws. Fucking bear paws are bad. So what? So there's no seal here. It's just a spring. Well, it's so good. So as, I, as that picture shows, we're going to... We're going to do a little bit of So this is why you can't take a pump apart and not put it in the seal. You hear that crunching? That's the ceramic or the carbon. So what this is, hold on to that. Where's that other one? Here it is. So this is a new seal here. This is when you go to grip and or you go somewhere and get a seal, this is a new seal. This is carbon, and this is ceramic. They make together. This one's stationary, and this one rotates. A little bit of water gets in there as a film, as a lubricant, and it creates, it keeps water from going out. So this seal here, this is called a secondary seal. That goes around this this brass shaft. That's the big. Yep, it keeps water from traveling along the shaft and coming up. And this is the main ring, and that's in there. Yeah, that's pressing that. So if you were to put a new one in, you'd have to pull that bad boy out. Well, what you nope. do, well, it comes apart still. What you do is you take this. Pop that out. You always want to mark it. 
So try to put a mark in there so you get these orientated right. Then you lay it on the surface and you take your screwdriver and you pound it out with your hammer. And most of the time it's done. Yeah, that's why, yeah. You're always going to be replacing it. So what that is, is that's this. That's this mating ring right inside of there. And this is that part. So this is a basic, this this seal's like 20 bucks. This whole kit's like 20 bucks. But it's a good idea to upgrade onto the Viton. If you can, yeah, if you upgrade the Viton, they give you a new rubber. So this is a, 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 a <laughs> Yeah, so this it's is... not necessarily the temperature. It's really the right? Yeah, it's the chemicals and the temperature. This is a Viton seal. The only indication is that green. That's the only indication that it's Viton. Uh, you can't feel the difference? Yeah, there yeah, it's, one, it's green. Is it harder? This one feels natural from the lamb skin. Oh, that's a green mark. What are we touching it with? Okay. And so yeah. when you replace these, you knock this out from the back. You clean this up. With, yeah, you knock it out with a chisel. You clean it up really good. And you use some milk. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We're oh, kind of jumping milk. ahead. You guys can yeah, order this through your that. truck stop. What I'm good yeah, at is that, that one is going to be harder to push in. Oh, that. Into that, onto that. But it's not going to probably spring out as bad. Uh, it, it'll work. Yeah, I'm just saying it, it'll oh, be in the order. So when you do this pump seal, you pop that out, you pop the rubber out, you clean it up. What I always did was I took the rubber, pushed it in there, and squirt this shit all over. Then you take this, take that ring. Right here, and you work the ring. And what I always do, I'll take like a the wooden wooden handled uh, a, like wire brush. The wooden wood's pretty soft. You can kind of use that and kind of tap it in there to get it to seat all the way. Because you want to make sure it goes back all the way into there, and, it, and it's got to be nice and even gap all the way around. That's the most important part: of putting that yeah. in all the way. Not even right. spit on it. You know, like, Once so that's done. Mm -hmm. Now you got this bitch. So I'm cleaning the shit out of it. Or the this is where you get angry. This is the bitch part. This is called a shaft sleeve. You can already see it. But Do you have that little decal that comes with the sleeve? Do you have that little paper? Because I just got a used one. So this is an old one. But this is a shaft sleeve. That This is what makes the seal, the connection between that seal and the uh, well, sleeve. But these should always be replaced if you're doing seals. So these are kind of a bitch to get off. When they put them on, they put on Loctite, put it on the shaft, and they slip that on there, the Loctite hardens. So the easiest way is to heat it up with a torch, let that Loctite break free, and slide it off. Make sure you pull this out. Who said you should replace them every time? I'm just curious. If it's, well, if it's damaged. If you can run your fingernail along it, and your fingernail gets hung up, you should. Why I say that is because you'll go to Griffin or somewhere and they'll say, well, What size sleeve you got? And you're like, All right, I'm pulling the yeah, apart. Make sure you won't you know, know what size it is. So then they have to cut it and make it for you, and that's not going to be in the next hour. So sometimes if your sleeve's okay, you scotch brand it, you check it, you're like, All right, I'm good to go. You don't always have to do it unless it's fucked up, which you'll see big grooves in it. And then, yeah. You know. If you can take every cloth and clean it up and it looks perfect, you should be able to redo that one. You might be able to. Most of them you can. Yeah. If you need to replace it, your first order should be heating it up and try to get it to slide off. The other way to do it, and Matt mentioned it, these come with a little piece of paper that says to remove this, take a ball peen hammer, and you smack it, starting back here, and you work your way that way, and then you turn it 90, and then you do it again. By pinging it like that, it expands it and it starts to walk off. Mm -hmm. But it's, it comes off pretty easily. They, they with can. The ball pin. Just three hits. Yeah, Remember that day we did it? Bam, bam, bam. This is brass. That one turned into quarter turn. Bam, bam, bam. Pretty easy. Yeah, pretty easy. Yeah, because yeah. 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 you've done that, you can try to on it. Yeah, that's just like yeah. yeah. it'll, it'll it come with to hold this main shaft and then you can try to turn it off. It'll come with a lube of Loctite. So you just take the Loctite. Squeeze it on there. The next one is going to fucking hate this. Yeah. Well, and that's then, okay. And then to make sure that, that, that gets all the way fully seated right on the back of that. Yep. Yeah, all that the way. Group. Well, right here. This is what I'll There's a taper. Part of this is that slinger that it called out. So if this leaks and water comes shooting out the back, it hits this rubber rather than going down oh. inside your motor. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the water slinger. Leave a picture of 
So this was just from the very end. They just gave it to me. So I, I didn't know it was going to happen. So that makes sense, to everybody. Pretty simple, huh? Yeah. Can I move on that? That's okay. <laughs> so this. Well, Barry, we're, that's another class. <laughs> Well, well, I'm saying you're doing, yeah, if you're doing a seal, water, you're doing bearings. There's either some bad water, yeah. you've captivated the shit out of the pump, or your bad bearings are all free or one yeah. of the two. It's always a good idea to replace bearings. I got a class I already built that we'll do on motor bearings. We'll take one of these apart, we'll heat it up, we'll slam them on, whatever. And you get credit for it. When you pull that this out and you look at that piece right here, because this is just kind of what it sits on, but you'll look at this and see that shoulder. Is that gone, or you see a big slash or a big piece of copper stuck in there, or anything like that? Then you go, okay, why did the seal break or go away? If it's totally grinded off. It's probably bad water, it's salty or sandy or whatever. But if it looks okay, maybe a little scuff, but it's probably bearings that are making it wobble. Bearings should always be done. Try if you're gonna do it, get this stuff. U.S. Seal loop. I got a little thing coming up on. It line. won't tell you what it is, but it does. Oh, uh, soap bubbles. Yeah, oh, really? That's, that's the best because it breaks the rubber down and makes it yeah, stick yeah. on. Well, and it evaporates completely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what, and it's food for you. Yeah. It's so much water for you. So. <laughs> Let's uh, get moving here on this. Get through this so we're not too much past seven. These are about 60 bucks. Um, so if you're doing pump skills, excuse me. Try to upgrade to that Viton. It's pretty cheap and it's worth it. Um, the beer is the standard, like I mentioned. That, that's what will come with it. Add 20 bucks for Viton. Might save you some heartache in the future. Um, Viton is always recommended for glycol. So if you're doing a chilled water loop um, or anything with, with heavy treatment, just go just spend the money, especially if it's a C contract, just get the Viton. This is your standard seal from Griffin. That's the one that was in that pump that we just took apart. You can tell by the white ring. If you look at a Griffin box, it says the C-A-C-E-B-U. That's a carbon ceramic butyl. That's what that means. So if you have a if you have a seal sitting on a job and you guys didn't really know what material it was, that's what that means if you ever get one. C-A carbon, C-E ceramic. So that's the primary ring is carbon, the mating ring is ceramic. One's harder than the other. That's your standard seal. And you can see here, that's the mating ring, that's the ceramic, and this is the carbon, that's the primary ring. If you have a job that'll pay for it, upgrading to silicon carbide is well worth it. It adds $200 to the cost of your seal. But it's way harder. <laughs> this is a silicon carbide seal. Extremely annular. You want to take the annular back? Oh, you'll see the color difference versus versus like this one that's has some light. There's a light will handle the. I didn't put the spring in on that one. Just even look, but it comes in the same. It's got a spring. So this is the same. This is other one. No, it's two completely different materials. No, I'm talking about is, or, oh yeah. Okay. Both of those are silicon carbide. But this one looks different. Yeah. One thing of note on these. Somebody mentioned it. Don't touch the rings if you. Oh, shit. Did you touch them? Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> these things have a shiny side and they have a dull side. Always make sure the shiny side goes towards the, the primary <laughs> you know, shiny side. <laughs> so make sure you're putting it in the right orientation if you're doing a pump seal. Don't put the dull side out. And try not to touch these, especially if you've got grease hard on the spaces. It's true like how old you You guys are old enough to know what those are. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're very, they're very brittle. Oh, they're fun to touch when you have greasy hands. So this is the, this is the uh, Jensk or the uh, Griffin box here. So that this one's silicon carbide, silicon carbide. So that's primary and mating ring, and then butyl. That's how they still come with that butyl uh, rubber. So even, even the silicon carbide, you'd have to upgrade to the Viton if you're going to go 
balls out with it. So you're going 220 instead of 200. Yeah, the wall. So you're going 220 instead of 220 <laughs> for the standard. It's a big jump. Uh, <laughs> then, <laughs> don't worry about the price. Did yeah. you tear this thing apart, tear the bearings out and all that? That's your 200 bucks. That's not. <laughs> so what U.S. Seal says about that, now of course this is their product, but it says if you use like a grease or a silicone, when the pump is started, that silicone draws in the carbon from the primary ring, so it's taken that carbon out, and it smears it on the face of the mating ring. And once that happens, it causes a buildup that destroys it. So if you're using silicone or you're using some other material to install those that doesn't evaporate or is not rated for it, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. Those are 20 bucks, and one of those bottles will last you fucking years. So if you're going to be doing one, go get a bottle of that stuff. I wouldn't screw with these small ones. I don't. I tried to. I tried to get like a case of these little one cc ones to give out or something. I couldn't even get them. So just go down and get one of those eight ounce bottles or four ounce or whatever. They're on the counter. Ones are. They're cheap. Griffin. Yeah, Griffin. Yeah. You know. Or just put on your truck stock. Take a picture of that one and send it well, in to me. Or just pocket it. Just later, but... Identifying causes of seal leakage. All these are, are these are in that U.S. Seal book. I'll put it on the Dropbox, and it's got a bunch of information on seals. But it kind of breaks down. If you're getting a seal failure, you can look at look at this chart and figure out why it failed and what you can do about it. If you got a cracked or broken mating ring, mating ring is the one with the rubber around it, the cup. Um, seal ran dry and heated up. Liquid reaches the seal faces. It was cooler and called thermal, cause thermal cracks. There's a lot of reasons why these things fail. So this chart would be something good to either have just at least available. It'll be in the Dropbox with the summary and all the stuff on this class, so you'll find it tomorrow. But there's a book called U.S. Seal Company, and uh, it'll be on there. It's got this chart and a bunch of other stuff in it. Anybody still reading this thing? Well, yeah, yeah, I wouldn't think so. I'm not going to go through every cause of a seal failure, but you'll have, you'll have this chart. I may even just send it out by itself. Um, base mounted pumps. We're almost done. This this is uh, like if you're here for the SKF class, this is just your standard big base mounted pump with a with a coupling. Uh, underneath this guard, there's a coupling that connects the, uh, the pump with the motor. Those are generally, or they can be, these big Sureflex couplings. If you've never messed with one, this is what they look like. One goes on a motor, one goes on a pump. You slide them together. They don't have to take any special. You just kind of push them together and lock them down on the shaft. They should be aligned if you weren't here for the SKF TKSA 11 class. Um, I can walk you through it, but it's a tool to align these. Instead of using a straight edge or a string, you put these two devices and they'll tell you which, where to raise it and lower it. Because if these aren't aligned, then it eats the coupling that causes problems. If you walk up to one of these and there's a pile of rubber laying on the ground, that's because this thing's misaligned and breaks the coupling. Um, these are easily replaced. They should be checked on maintenance. You can see this one's in pretty good shape. It's got decent teeth to it. They just released this orange looking one that's supposedly three times better. I already did. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> so, so I feel like probably that's your weak link. Did you really have that weak link? Well, and Matt brings it. This is, yeah, it'd still be a fuse. That acts as a fuse. So if you get something that comes down the line and jams that impeller, that thing's designed to break. They also have, which I'd never, I'd never installed, but this is a split coupling. This, this comes in two halves. A lot of these pumps, the, the shafts are close, so you have to take the bolts out and you have to remove one of the, uh, remove one of the, remove the motor to get that bitch out of there. Uh, you don't want to have this This is a split one here. This one's split, so you can actually just take it apart, put it on there, and then it's got this ring that reattaches around it. Supposedly, can it's you go back strong. one screen? <laughs> sure, you've got those. That's pretty intimate. Cool. The sharing has them. Oh, the splits? I did find that, you know, it's kind of, when you, when you do this, you kind of want to find that right mating point. Because there is, it's like a belt. It looks right, but it's better one way than the other. I could see that. Do you have a question on this, Marcus? Yeah, that, the bearings 
on the right here. Yeah. So some of these, some of these have oil in them. Some of them have zerk fittings. Some of them have a like a cap, and then you take the cap off. You're ready to go well, then it has to be pressed in, right? Yeah, we generally don't do these in the field. This whole thing gets taken down to Griffin or down to Cascade Machine, and they'll put new bearings in it. So, if you've got a seal leak, you got water running out of this end down here. Call Marcus. That's a bit of a That's, that's, that's call. the exact one I pulled out. Oh, really? And then I called Matt. I'm like, dude, how do I get these bearings out of this thing? You don't. He's like, oh, dude, you can take that to her. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you got to let Terry deal with it because that's. Don't press them out or whatever. Yeah. And then he paints I it. I pulled them out, but you, you wanted to press them in nice. Yeah. 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 And I might, if there's call for it, we could. I just chucked one of these in the garbage today. I saw that green one. Right yeah. There. I chucked it in there. I was going to tell you about it. I was like, that's a big old mystery. No. I say we might be able to. Maybe we could do one of these in the class, but I don't know if we want to start doing those or not. I've never done them. Like I've always just taken them to Cascade or Griffin or John Julian. Well, yeah, because yeah, you're you know, fouled you know. off, fouled off, and then you're. Well, like you said, with that two hundred dollar seal, I had those rebased because they're that expensive. But if you do it to Griffin, the guy is retiring soon. He only comes in on Tuesdays and he's only here for half day. You know what I mean? So it's you're gonna get it done. But we're not going to get a refacing machine for seals. But no. uh, the other option is, is these. Uh, this is an L-jaw coupling. Uh, these are generally on the smaller, on the smaller pumps. These ones are a fail-safe, so if that rubber fails, they still turn. So there is no fuse, unlike that one. But these just have these little star rubbers. You can get these in different materials if they're in an environment that there might be, like. Cool chemicals that might eat away one rubber, you can get in another. Same thing if you walk up to it and there's a pile of rubber in there, with the cool chemicals you can steal it. Possibly. Work it. Now, does that, do you sandwich, do you make those as tight as possible, or do you want to just snug them up? They don't have to be like pressed in. Snug it, snug it, Doug. Right. Let's go on. Like, this is that TKSA 11. I don't know if, how many of you guys were in here for the, that. Um, oh, yeah. It's right here, but it's super awesome. It does a really good job. If you weren't here, which I think all you guys were. I wasn't. I, was, I, I, I checked. You sent out that thing. And yeah. I did it on Skylight. Good. Uh, it basically it'll tell you where to move that motor so that you get that coupling in alignment so you don't have vibration, you don't have coupling and wearing. Um, it works really good. We got three of them now, so there's generally one available if you want to use it. I'd recommend you guys use it for all of them. Um, this is a little bigger pump. This is a, a double suction vertical split case, kind of like what they had out of Wesley. Every Wesley I got a DS6. Yeah, it does look like a fire <laughs> That's good size, and then they get even bigger. This is that's what I well, I don't have the one on the left. This is a big bucker. Yeah, we don't do a whole lot of work on those. Yeah, just six little on a lot of these, just so you know, the seals leak, but they're designed for it. They'll have a little catch pan. They'll have a tube that runs down and goes to a drain. Like anyone's done like waterfall garden. They oh, you've been there. there? Uh, I would for a long time. Yeah. Is that where home years ago? Seen? I went in there and I'm like, oh fuck. Shut it off there. I mean, but it, the packing was bad, that rope. Yeah. So you can tighten down those four bolts and kind of sandwich the packing. Yeah. Like if it's someone had already bought it out. Yeah. It's supposed to do it. Yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. Some of those are designed. But I thought it was like a bad seal. Yeah. Packing some of those are just do packings are designed to drip. Yeah. Away. Especially on fire pumps and these big ones. A little bit of water dripping isn't. Anything compared to fixing this thing. Sort of Especially fire pumps. Like those seals that we looked at, those are made to be like to run. Like that's how they're they're designed to be. So when they sit for a long time, it's not uncommon to get a little bit of debris out of them. Run them for a while, let them wear in, and then a lot of times they'll seal back up. So it's good and everything, all that stuff likes to run. Yes, I once saw uh, the pump leaking during this winter. And I went back in the springtime and it was good. No one had fixed it. Did you spit on it? No, it was just fixed itself. The only reason I left this in there is because that, that big ass pump we saw, it's rated at 40,000 gallons of that. 
at 600 foot ahead. Oh. <laughs> It'll pump up 600 feet. <laughs> fucking 40,000 gallons a minute. Could you imagine? I couldn't imagine what that cost to do. How would you like to drink from the bottom of that? Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's I couldn't right imagine. You. That's it. You're done. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to send out a survey. I always got to do surveys. Thank you. Keep it in mind. You take it. Get it done. No, I'll get it before I even get home. I'm gonna try. I had it written and then I erased it. Ah! Let's go. This Oh shit! Got hurt in class. Full attack out of a boot. I don't even know where it went. <laughs> now somebody else is going to step on it. You guys, anybody have any more questions on this side before I slap it back together? Slap it happen? Dougie? Dougie? That's great. That's fresh. That's huge. Dougie's fresh? You don't like great stuff? My kids are here. This one is... Yeah, I don't want to get a piece. Oh, I have to say, it's mechanical. Probably the most yeah. food that I've ever seen for six people. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, I have. The, the spicy, the spicy stuff is really good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, Chevy. Explain <laughs> 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 that.